Good evening. I'm calling to order the regular Fairfax Town Council meeting for Wednesday, November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Michelle, may I have a roll call, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Council Member Goddard. I'm here. Council Member Kohler. Here. Council Member Ackerman. Present. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Present. And Mayor Hellman. I am here, thank you. And let's proceed with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, can I get a motion please to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any nays? Motion passes. Um, next thing on the agenda, we didn't have any closed sessions, so that item is moot. And Barbara, would you like to read the land acknowledgement? Sure. The Fairfax Town Council acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors past, present and emerging. Thank you. Moving on to meeting protocol, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Please turn off your cell phones or place them in silent mode. At 10 p.m., we will review the agenda to ascertain which items, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter not started by 1130 will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. Moving on to announcements, I have a couple of announcements. I know Vice Mayor Cutrano does as well. Uh, the first one is the Ross Valley School Board seeks community members for advisory committee. Um, they're seeking members, uh, community members interested in serving on the district's facilities advisory 711 committee. And the purpose of the 711 committee is to advise the board based on community input regarding the use or disposition of school buildings, space or property that is not needed for school purposes. And this is per Ed Code Section 17388. And at this time, Deer Park is the only property that has been identified as not being needed for school purposes. So if you're interested, please complete and submit the application by 7 a.m. on November 7th. So that's just a few days away. You can find more information on the Ross Valley School District website. We also have it on our homepage, more information. Uh, the second announce announcement is Marin Foster Care Association is hosting a food drive at our town hall from last Thursday, the 27th through Monday, November 14th. The food will be delivered to youth aging out of foster care and families in reunification who need extra support. And it would be appreciated if you could drop off non-perishable food items in the marked bin in the lobby of the town hall. Example of food items include canned food, nut butters, rice, crackers, shelf-stable milks, pasta, tomato sauce, applesauce, cereal, olive oil, soup broth, et cetera. Uh, their website is marinfostercare.org uh, to learn more. And Michelle, as our election officials, would you provide the community some information about the election? Thank you. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, this year, it's a little different and the town, uh, the Marin County elections wants everyone to realize that they have moved fully to vote centers rather than polling places. So if you used to go to, for example, the Fairfax library, it's not a polling place anymore. 
The vote center is in this room in the Marin in the women's club, but there are vote centers all over the county and you can go to any vote center now if you're a Fairfax resident or a Marin, any Marin jurisdiction can vote at any vote center and some of the vote centers have already opened. This vote center opens this Saturday and will be open through election day on, um, well, I wrote down when the polls close. It's posted on our website, hang on. Uh, we are open Saturday, Sunday, Monday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. here and on Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And of course you all received a ballot in the mail and you can drop that in any mailbox or a ballot drop box. Um, and if you go to Marin, oh, what's it called? I think it's marinvotes.org is the um, county's website. You can see locations for everything. Thank you. And my understanding is if you, for some reason, didn't receive your in-home ballot or you want to register same day, you can do so Yes, here. that's the same um, as it has always been. It's actually, you can do that at any, at any vote center. You used to have to just do it at the elections department. Okay. And this is the only voting center in Fairfax or are there others? This is it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Chance. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just one thing. Uh, we have a proclamation that didn't get to make it onto the agenda yet, but it'll be on the next agenda for the special meeting this month. Um, but it's just acknowledging that this is Native American Heritage Month. Um, and so we will eventually post that proclamation. Um, we worked on that proclamation with the Federated Indian Indians of Great and Rancheria. Um, and I just wanted to also note that if you're interested, you know, for your friends or your family or colleagues in learning more about uh, the native communities that have stewarded this land for millennia, um, Marin County Free Libraries does have a website where they've compiled an incredible list of resources, books, multimedia, you know, audio recordings and um, videos to learn more about um, uh, California tribes, as well as uh, the Coast Miwok and the tribes of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I'm not going to read the proclamation, but just wanted to acknowledge that and um, yeah, say thanks. Thanks for working on that. I appreciate it. Um, Council Member Goddard, do you have an announcement? I do. This is not a traditional type of announcement. This is an announcement of gratitude, um, one to the uh, residents of Dominga Avenue for hosting a splendid Halloween Eve um, and the Chamber of Commerce for the Halloween Parade, um, and an expression to Tuna Fish Monkey Mind Salen, who um, is otherwise known as Sierra Salen. Um, he took hundreds of pictures. It is the most beautiful display of Fairfax faces that I've ever seen. Um, I encourage you, he does post it on Facebook, but I'm sure if you reached out to him, not too hard to find, I could guide you there. He would share with you and you would be very proud of the town that you live in. So a big shout out to Sierra Salen and to the residents of Dominga. Thank you so much. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor has one more. Yeah, just one more quick one, which uh, I just got a notification. So I figured I'd share that with everybody that PG&E is doing a virtual North Coast Town Hall on November 15th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. That's a Tuesday, and it's an opportunity to give feedback to PG&E um, about work that you've seen or you know, ask questions about the work that they're doing in our community. Obviously, there have been a lot of questions about the work they're doing. Um, so we'll get that up on our website and put that in our newsletter. Um, and you can go on the pg &E website to find out more about that. But getting a lot of interest in it and saw this coming up. So just wanted to alert the, the public about that. Thank you. And final announcement is regarding our commissions or committees. There are vacancies on the Climate Action Committee. Parks and Rec Commission, our volunteer board, as well as the Open Space Committee. And you can see our town website for more details. Moving on, concerning open time for public expression, this is the time to address the council on matters not on the agenda. Individuals are limited to two minutes, subject to the mayor's discretion. The council is not permitted to take action and state law strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be demonstrated to be of an emergency nature or the need to take immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. 
If there are still raised hands after 30 minutes, open time will be continued to the end of the agenda. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, anyway, I'd like to start. Uh, my name is Rick Hamer. I'm a member of the Affordable Housing Committee. I'll be making comments on uh, personal comments tonight. Um, first of all, mountains of gratitude to Renee Goddard. In fact, uh, I wish to thank the entire town council for being so level-headed and doing a good job. I know that's not perfect and things rarely are, but um, I think you've handled your role well. Um, I'll leave my questions and opinions about where breakdowns occur for another time when there is more time. I wanna point out here that that took 30 seconds, okay? Uh, on October 13th, a number mem another member of the public made a public comment referencing California appellate court rules about the three minute public comment being reduced to two minutes. We, the public, do not have very much opportunity at public hearings in order to voice our concerns. As I just did, many, many members of the public spend the first 30 to 40 seconds introducing themselves and thanking the town. This is important. But when the speaker only has 70 seconds to address broad issues, it's simply not enough time. Please keep the public comment timer at three minutes unless, in Mark's words, two minutes may be reasonable, but only if the agenda is long and there are a vast number of people who want to speak. And this has usually not been the case. Thank you. Thank you. So I could be mistaken, but I believe if there, you also are uh, representing an organization, you can ask for an extra minute. Is that correct? Yes. I'm also representing Marin Freedom Rising, and I would like three minutes. Thank you very much. Regarding the housing element, the climate action building policy, gas stations, obvious phase out, and in general, the recent policies of this board, I have a rhetorical question for you. Which would you rather live in, a surveillance state or a strong, nature-oriented, artistic, healing arts, multicultural, eclectic, and joyous, quirky small town. Which Fairfax would you rather bring into the future, especially when the future is now? I ask this question because based upon your recent policy making, it is easy to see that regardless of what is in your hearts, you are empowering multinational corporations and government actors more intelligent, larger, and more powerful and influential than ourselves to implement in incremental phases of seemingly unrelated policy, a blueprint following a China-style surveillance state model. I am certain most of the people in Fairfax would never want to live in the plans that you are blueprinting now as seeds in our town. Think I'm crazy? Can't see the writing on the wall? Or how systems work in ways that on a local level are often hard to see? For this briefing, I will just share. Right now, a social credit system aimed at modifying climate change behaviors is being deployed in Italy. In the city of Bologna, as part of a new pilot project, citizens who display good behavior, such as correctly recycling or using public transportation, will be rewarded. The entire pro pilot project is being based on control for climate change readiness. One moment you can get rewarded for taking the bus instead of buying a car. The next you can get one for a new e-bike. But then what? What about if you don't want to go to church or if you do? It, would, it really doesn't matter because at any point you could have it be changed by government. You have given all your power away to in the name of safety, security, public health, and climate action. Where does the surveillance begin and where does it end? This is not freedom. It's not democracy. It's corporate fascism. When the money powers are in conspiracy with the policy powers and dangerously slow. So. The Chinese surveillance state uses vast quantities of data and cutting edge artificial intelligence to build a nimbler form of authoritarianism that's capable of exercising unprecedented control. All of this needs electrification. Cameras need computers, computers need electricity, electric vehicles that require kill switches, smart houses that use electronic keys to get in and also out of, 
but maybe not if there's a button that doesn't let you in or out somewhere else. Where will all of this electrifying come from for powering everything? We can see the mechanisms of town council's many climate action and equity-based policies, as well as the call for high density urbanization of our small town. There is indeed a push towards a smart city type of building, which can and would inch its way to the re resilient infrastructure by design. Resilient infrastructure is a buzzword by the World uh, Economic Forum, by the way, where they say, I own nothing, I have no privacy, and life is better than it's ever been. Is that really where we want to go? Good evening, Council. Good evening. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I wasn't going to speak. I bet I'm just going to share something that I've been ruminating in um, today that, um, yeah, I think needs to be talked about in more um, open and public spaces. And um, so bear with me. I, I have a friend named Mark, and um, I've known Mark since high school. Um, we were really close, played baseball together. Um, grew up together, experienced a lot of things together. Um, and Mark struggled with addiction, you know, um, his entire adult life, you know, and he started checking in and out of treatment centers um, in about 2000. Um, and in 2020, 2019, 2020, um, Mark moved to Marin. He, we, he grew up in the city. Um, and he moved to Marin and he was living in a sober living environment in Terra Linda, um, and things had changed and he was, you know, the beauty of Marin was impacting his sobriety. Um, and he was creating a full life for himself, was back engaged with his children who were call in college. Um, and then Mark slipped and, um, he went back to using drugs and it was one time, um, and he was poisoned by fentanyl. Um, the drugs were different than what he had experienced before. Um, and so I just saw that uh, Gavin, Gavin Newsom finally passed to make um, fentanyl test strips legal in, in August. And I, I'd really like to start to normalize the conversation of fentanyl test strips and their availability and Narcan training um, and just put it out there and start to break down the stigmas that are around it because they both save lives. Thank you. Deborah Benson, Cascade Drive, Fairfax. Thank you for hearing me, Council. Um, two things. This two-minute um, uh, speech allowance uh, feels like you're you're pushing the the public to the back of the room, which, in fact, if um, the people who want to speak haven't spoken in the first 30 minutes, we're pushed to the end of the agenda. That was put in place with an interim town manager not too long ago. And I would like to see the council go back to giving the members of the public who care enough about this town to take their time and show up here three minutes and to take away this 30 minute uh, uh, barrier. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is that I am in great despair over the number of trees that PG&E has been allowed to massacre in this town. Um, I, I worked on uh, notifying PG&E from the beginning. I worked on notifying Mayor Hellman about what was going on. I went around when there were lists provided of the trees to be cut. Um, looked at them. They were they were written on the PG&E reports as dead or dying, which is the only uh, gives them the right to take the trees down. They have to be dead or dying or a danger to their lines. And 90 percent of these trees were not dead or dying. Other communities have fought back. Mill Valley is holding them back. Woodacre uh, people put uh, caution ribbons around the trees uh, at the post office that they were going to take down. A couple in Nicasio, when the contractor showed up, instead of three trees they said they were going to take, they intended to take 68. They called the sheriff and the sheriff chased them off. We have not even used the one tool that, according to the town attorney, we had, which was to require homeowners to abide by the tree ordinance and apply for a permit. 
which would have given us some opportunity to educate the public on what recourse they might have. So I'm very disappointed in what has not been done. Thank you. Hmm, Jane Richardson Mack, I'm Madrone Road, 40 year resident. I concur with what Deborah said. It's really a sacrilege what's happening and we need your help to try to call it back or use reason at least and inform the public how many trees are meant to be cut down um, in 10 days in advance. It's just a nice thing to do. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I wanna thank you for having this live. I hope it continues, makes it more real, um, but, what I'm concerned about is I would like to know what's happening with changing the name of Sir Francis Drake. I haven't heard anything about that in a long time. And I'm terribly afraid that I'm gonna wake up one morning and it will be a done deal. Kind of like what happened, striping Cascade. It's like the public needs to be able to weigh in on this matter. It can't be decided by just the town council. It's far too important. I don't believe that Sir Francis Drake has been properly vetted. I think it was a big boogeyman campaign, and now children are frightened by the very name. I mean, where are the adults in the room? We should be able to research the man, vet him, don't hang him <laughs> before anybody's, anybody's had a chance to speak. On the positive side, it's all, ooh, ooh. it's not the case. It's a very expensive project. It's very disruptive and destructive. There is a constructive way to do it, and that is put alternate signage. Let the people have their say. Educate people about what the road was first used for. Educate people about Sir Francis Drake. Don't just go with whispers and fear tactics. It's not the case. So um, please, can we have some light on the subject? But most of all, could you please report where the stat what's the status of this matter? Are you discussing it? Are there any plans? Are there any dates? Um, please let the public know in advance. We have a right to speak. It's our road, our tax paying money. Thank you. Mark Bell, Fairfax. I'll be speaking uh, also for uh, Save Dominga Avenue. So that is a group. Uh, the California Appellate Court ruled that a three minute time limit is a reasonable restriction. The case is Ribicoff versus Long Beach. And as Rick stated, only if an agenda is extremely long and or there are a massive amount of people who wanna speak. And that's not what happened on the 13th, barely maybe on the 11th, maybe. And today you have really what? Two, three items on the regular agenda that really take discussion from the public. It's a violation of the California appellate court ruling. Now, back to what you did at the meeting before. You violated the California Supreme Court ruling from 1990, the Supreme Court versus Walnut Creek, which says under state law, land use actions must be consistent with the adopted general plan. So if you want to start changing, which you did, the noise character of the downtown without amending and having approved the general plan, you've in violation of a California Supreme Court ruling. The California Supreme Court also said in that discussion uh, of their opinion that a general plan is on par with being a constitution of a town. Now, I don't understand how an attorney who, in her own words, is an expert on land use, doesn't know about this ruling and didn't speak up. There are, are means within the general plan, if you wish to change the downtown, which involves acoustic studies that are pretty extensive, not only by the town, but also by any restaurant owner who wants to put amplified music on a parklet. You're talking about nine, was it nine parklets? Uh, plus Perry's, uh, plus I'm sure uh, Max will wonder why they can't do that. This is a violation 
of supreme adjudicated California law, and you took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of California, which means Supreme Court rulings must bind your actions, and they and you ignored them. You dismissed them. You broke the law. In these two cases, within 72 hours, probably even 48, I should probably count better. And then I see, oh, I always follow the law. Really? What could be clearer? What could be plainer than that? It's a violation. We used to have an attorney here who, when the town council started going off the tracks, would say, I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's illegal. You can do it this way, but you can't do it that way. Who's advising you? And why aren't you, why can't you even advise yourself? Hello, Town Council. Um, the first thing I'd like to address, Madam Mayor, when people take their time to come up here, if you could please look at the audience and to the speaker. I see four people that you sit with that are being very polite, independent of their opinion. They're not digging in their checkbook. They're not writing your notes or on your phone. It's very rude. And your job is really to listen to your constituents. I see four people around you trying very hard to do just that. And what I've seen, like even the last meeting, where you tried to cut the power off many times because you did not like hearing what I said. When I brought up not following the laws of California Government Code 6250 through 6270, you told me on the floor when I tried to be very nice and explain that to you, that you didn't know those laws, so you weren't going to comply with them. I encourage you to look them up. But above all, if you could please be as respectful as the rest of the members on his council and address the audience that's speaking to you, it would be appreciated. Thank you. Hi, Todd Greenberg on Bolinas Road here in Fairfax. I wanna thank all of you and everybody else that is here and everybody that's listening on TV and trying to participate. And I wanna recognize the people that are not participating any longer because they've been frustrated as many of the people here are. I want to ask for some explanation without getting a broad explanation from all of you collectively, if possible, because I've heard that you want to hear us and I understand the issues that you're dealing with are complex, but I don't understand and I don't think much of the audience understands the people that I've spoken to don't understand why some of the decisions are being made without a vote of the people with very little consideration. I think a lot of people, and I think if you did a survey, you'd find that a lot of people are, are really, really bummed out at how decisions are being made. I'm sorry to have to say this, but I, I just wanted to go on record without getting down to the details that some of the other speakers have brought up that I think a lot of the issues on the agenda tonight and that decisions have been recently made should have been made by a vote of the people. That's all. Thank you. Is there any other members of the public who wish to speak? Great, thank you. Good evening. You might wanna pull down the, there you go. Name is Michael Kepper. I'm a Fairfax resident for 13 years. And I understand that the committee is um, contemplating rent control um, issues. Sir, if that, that item is on the agenda, so okay. the time to, provide comment is when we get to it. Do you have any, uh, do you have anything you want to share that's not on the agenda? Um, no. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. 
Hi, Aaron Billman, Porteous, Ab, and Fairfax. And I'm I'm new to the process, so I'm here to learn. And my main question is that is there a resource that outlines where town council decision making responsibilities start and stop vis-a-vis -vis responsibilities of putting it to vote that would be a helpful kind of starting point for understanding um, where roles and roles responsibilities fit, or is that negotiated, you know, town by town? Hello, I'm Michelle Allen. I'm very interested in the housing time. So I guess most of my comments will wait till that comes in. I'm a current renter. I hold a section eight voucher for 30 plus years in Marin County. I've got a lot that I can say regarding the housing right now and my rental here. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? on items not on the agenda? Okay. You wanna check Zoom? Oh, thank you. Are there any hands raised on Zoom? Yes, there are. There are Great. two hands raised on thank Zoom. You. Um, the first speaker is Joseph Winagel, followed by Megan. And Joseph, you're unmuted. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor and Town Council. Thank you for the time here this evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Winagel and uh, I'm in the Deer Park neighborhood. And I'm here tonight speaking as Fairfax's representative on the Marin County Commission on Aging. And just a couple of quick notes. Um, as always, the monthly Marin Commission on Aging uh, meeting, presentation and business meeting uh, will be tomorrow, um, the first Thursday of the month. And tomorrow we have a presentation on First Five, an organization that you may think of as uh, primarily focused on uh, younger children, but uh, I think it's going to be an opportunity for a really insightful and tremendous discussion around um, uh, intergenerational, uh, the value of intergenerational activities. So if anyone wants to join, um, I would ask that um, you look on the town website under the age-friendly Fairfax page, and there's a lot of resources there including, and this is my second note, including the monthly newsletter. Um, if anyone had been accustomed to receiving the newsletter in their email, um, that isn't happening at this moment, but all that same information is available on the website uh, in a PDF uh, format. So you can view it there, or if, um, if it's your preference to print it out, that's available as well. And there's uh, many, many wonderful resources and events and activities throughout the month of November. Uh, thank you for your time. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Jessa. Thank you. The next speaker is Megan, and you're unmuted now. You might have to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone listening um, was aware that Marin Freedom Rising is a racist, homophobic, anti-science and anti-vax organization. So I'd urge everyone listening to take anyone supported by that group with a large grain of salt. Also, <clears throat> if we could perhaps not have the misogyny from the audience chastising women for not performing the act of paying attention in an arbitrary way, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Any other raised hands? I see none, Madam Mayor, if you want to close the open time. I will close the open time. Can I just say one quick thing, sure. Madam Mayor? I just hope that as we move through the night, we can all keep a level of civility um, with our comments, both to the council, but also to each other as we're making comments. Um, just wanted to note that. I appreciate the passion and the energy, but I hope that we can keep things civil per what you laid out earlier in the agenda. Thank you. And I understand Council Member Kohler has an announcement that she forgot to share earlier. I apologize. Joseph Benagel reminded me of a big event we're having this Saturday. I'm part of Age Friendly as well. And this is our Celebrating People 90 and Better annual event. This is our fifth year. 
And uh, we've identified over 50 people, over 90 in town. 20 people have chosen to participate. In the last three years, we delivered gift bags to each person and spent a visit with them. So uh, some of us will be participating in that. And it's always a wonderful event. Um, it's a sad one for me because a few people I visited last year are gone. But then again, they lived really long lives. Um, it's actually, there's no specific place to go. We each deliver a gift basket to someone's home. So there'll be some information on the website afterwards. Um, anyway, it's a wonderful event that I've been honored to participate in the last five years. Wonderful, thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar. The council may approve the entire consent calendar with one action or vote. Alternatively, items on the consent calendar may be removed by any council member or staff member for separate discussion and vote. The opportunity for public comment on consent calendar items will occur prior to the council's vote on the consent calendar. So first we'll take any clarifying questions and then we'll open the public comment prior to taking action. Go ahead. Is it appropriate to say I'd like to pull one now? I'd like to pull item 13 um, and just do it at the end of consent. I'd just like it to be separate if you don't mind. That's fine. Anyone else have a clarifying question or want to pull an item? I just want to note that I had some edits in, that I sent to Michelle in the minutes um, for my name. People, I was, it was typed as Chase, not Chance, which is, happens frequently, but I just want to <laughs> note that. But. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, we will open public comment on consent, please. Now is the time to step forward or raise your hand. Anyone in the room? Deborah Benson, um, Cascade Drive, Fairfax. Um, I believe it's number seven, a report from Public Works. I've asked uh, the interim Public Works director, prior interim, <laughs> uh, about a project that was suggested by our town arborist to make a curb cut in um, the curb where the runoff comes down from Vreden uh, to allow floodwaters to, or rain to irrigate the redwood groves. And um, that public works director said that there was funding, uh, uh, flood funding available for it and asked me to instruct him as a member of the tree committee to put that in the works. And I haven't seen it in the works. So I just like to say that I would like to because the redwoods need as much water as we can give them. Thank you. Mark Bell, I wasn't clear on what's happening with 13, but I just wanted to comment on it. Um, well, we've pulled it off, so it'll be a separate agenda item that you can talk. Comment on it. That yeah, thank you. Does any other members of the public in the room have comment on the consent calendar? And if you're on Zoom, now is the time to raise your hand, please. Thank you. I don't see any raised hands on Zoom for the consent calendar public comment period. Okay, I'm closing public comment on consent calendar, taking it back for uh, discussion. Um, I have a couple of comments. So I just wanted for transparency, I understand that there may be some changes coming down the pike on number one. Um, as far as hybrid meetings, is there any anything concrete we can share about in person and hybrid going forward? Janet? The governor has announced that the state of emergency ends on February 28th, 2023. And so after that, um, the AB 361 rules, while they'll still be effective, they don't go out um, until January 1st of 2024 they will not be able to be used um, because it requires a governor's state of emergency to be able to use the AB 361 um, rules. And so there is a new set of rules that takes effect January 1st, 
2023, but there's also the old rules that still stay in effect as well. And so we're preparing a, um, a memo to the council and we'll be having a presentation for that. Okay, so to be determined if we will be after February being con continue in the current hybrid format. No, we will um, probably continue in the current hybrid format. Okay. It'll just have um, the new rules governing the council's participation. In I that, see. In that hybrid format. Okay, but the public. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anybody, I have more comments. Does anyone yeah. have them? I, I just had one yeah. and I let the town clerk know um, just a couple of typos on um, item 10, which is the um, the letter um, of concern to MTC and Caltrans regarding Highway 37. Um, very basic typos. And then I had something on 13, but we're going to discuss that after. Um, real quick, thank you to Ted Pugh for stepping up again to uh, serve on the tree committee. I think it's worth thanking all of our committee and board members who um, especially continue to step up to serve the town. Um, we desperately need folks who will step up and do this. So thank you to Ted. Um, and then also thank you to Lauren for a fabulous public works uh, report and update. It's such a pleasure and so important for the town that you are here. So thank you. Yeah, uh, Lauren, I was gonna say thank you. So this is our, if you haven't met Lauren, this is Lauren Umbertus, our new director of public works. He is no, he's not interim. He is with us on staff. We are delighted. And this is a really um, robust list. And I look forward to more detail, but I just want to really recognize that you've hit the ground running. And there's so much on here that we could probably spend 90 minutes on it, but we won't. Um, if you wouldn't mind just expanding on, um, where is it? The um, I know you're taking a couple of um, bids on pavement and I know that's on a lot of folks' minds and I, I would just love to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you, Mayor Hellman. Uh, and thank you, um, Council Member Goddard for those nice words. Uh, you are referring specifically to the one on scenic? No, just, just in, general, in general, I think you're, taking so currently what we do have is we have a proposal for repaving a section of scenic between azalea and manor uh, that's in process we're getting some updated numbers from a couple of different contractors we don't have any other numbers on other projects at this time that, that are specific we're waiting on our pavement condition index which should be in our hands within the next few weeks to a month uh, that will help us start to generate a program for street repair that will be over a number of years. Uh, we are Do you looking- Do mind just explaining what that is for the public? Sure, so uh, there is a process where uh, um, outside agencies will grade the streets uh, within a community and that is um, taken place and we will be receiving basically a grade and further descriptions and detail about the conditions of our roads. Uh, currently Fairfax is pretty low on that list within Marin County. From that list, uh, we'll be able to start generating a program to uh, identify costs uh, and, and areas so that we can create kind of a long-term program to fix those streets and roads. Uh, that report will be made available, available to the council and to the public. Uh, so we'll be coming back with uh, further detail on that. But once we get that information, that helps us to start allocating resources to start addressing some of those roads. Terrific, thank you. And then um, on the vegetation management work is the third bullet on the second page. Work will proceed um, on Fairfax paths and trails. Is that pedestrian trails specifically? Is that what you're referring to there? The money we have allocated, allocated for that? Yes, pedestrian trails. Okay, great. Just wanted to confirm that. And to just add to that, uh, I've had conversations with Council Member Goddard on that and with a couple of other contractors. It's I not just vegetation. I think you've had conversations with me. Oh, with Cole, sorry. About sorry, yes, sorry. My, my apologies. At least that. my recollection. Yes. I could be wrong. It, it, it was only 24 hours ago uh, with Council Member uh, Cole. Yes, and so we've talked to contractors. I've talked to the Conservation Corps. It will include not only vegetation management, but also uh, the addressing of the condition of steps that are along those paths as well. 
Terrific, thank you. Yeah, and please include me going forward because I'm interested in yeah, this we was, were on a subcommittee related this to this was just an informal yeah. um and it goes back to the that. meeting we had in October, right. which has fallen through the cracks. So um it was just informal. No problem. Okay. Uh, moving on, unless anyone has anything. Just one more thing, since we're asking questions about this fabulous update. Um, Lauren, could you um, share a little bit about the um, the tree work? It came up a while back, um, and we created a tree maintenance plan. You mentioned here that we might be making some improvements to that plan. A member from the public just spoke to um, possible improvements that could be made. Could you just speak a little bit to that and recycled water and planting opportunities and things like that? Sure. Uh, thank you, um, Council Member. <laughs> uh, I so I the the tree maintenance program plan was generated by uh, local arborist Ray Moritz of Urban Forestry. He and I have a history going back a number of years, and we met personally uh, a couple of weeks ago and walked Perry Park and reviewed some of the information that he's provided to the city because of the. Uh, um, interim directors that have been in place for the last year or so and the fact that Garrett Toy, the previous town manager and director of public works, had a lot of things on his plate. Uh, it may not have been addressed and actions may not have been taken as, as much as sh should have. So Ray and I had a really great conversation about tree maintenance within Perry Park. Uh, we are going to have him come back on board, update that plan. Uh, with regard to tree maintenance. Uh, we also had discussions about doing a passive irrigation system as was brought up by the public just a few minutes ago about trying to uh, uh, take stormwater that gets onto the streets and use that as a passive means of, of irrigating those redwoods. So those conversations are in place. And my um, hope is that within the next you know, month or so, we'll have an updated plan from uh, Ray Moritz, and then we'll start being able to implement some of those improvements. The irrigation uh, and some of the other improvements may take a little bit longer, but some of the tree maintenance might be able to happen much sooner. Can I, can I just um, pile on a little bit? Uh, even though that plan was specific for Perry Park, we really intended the plan to be broader and deal with Bolinas Park. And so while the redwoods are so critical to us, um, in Perry Park, um, I think, don't forget about Bolinas Park. We have redwoods there, we have other trees there. And so they're not as stressed, but I'm hoping that you broaden that to Bolinas Park. And also trees in the parkade, et cetera. Trees in the parkade, uh, Bolinas Park, and also uh, Doc Edgar's Park are also included in that informal discussion. So absolutely, I'll make sure that that's included as well. Thank you, Lauren. Terrific. Thank you very much, Lauren. Okay, moving on. I just wanted to thank Vice Mayor for your changes to the MTC uh, letter concerning Highway 37. And are we ready to, can I hear a motion to approve consent? I'm happy to make that motion to approve consent um, without item 13. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay. M a motion to approve consent passes. All right. Moving on to the regular agenda. Let's. I think we were going to take item 13. Yeah. I was oh, about I'm... to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you No problem. Number 13 authorized the mayor to send letter to the Marin County Board of Supervisors in support of Golden Gate Village residence plan for deep green renovations and a pathway to ownership. Let me pull it out of my, who, do you wanted to pull it? I wanted to pull it, but maybe we should go to the public first. Sure, that's fine. Let's open the public comment on item number 13. Mark Bell, Fairfax, I'd like three minutes because I don't want to be in violation of a California appellate court ruling. I won't need it all. I just wanted to say as far as 13, 
uh, and the actions of the supervisors at the County of Marin, I really can't think of anyone's behavior more disgusting than the Board of Supervisors. I don't know if these people are even gonna have heat this year for the fourth winter. I don't know if the holes there, the rats get into the building have been addressed. It's disgusting behavior. And I'm glad that we are sending a letter in support of what the residents there wanna do. And I wish there was more that, that we could do. I recommended that when they were talking a few months ago to finally, after years, allow the Golden Gate Village community to have a say in their future. And they were giving them some money. I said, well, where's the money for heaters? Where's the money for masons? Where's the money for exterminators? Got no response. So uh, I applaud your action. Council, I certainly um, support what Mark just brought up. So within the last week, I sent off an email to Royce and asked her if she'd be interested in learning about public purpose bonds. Public purpose bonds are available right now through the HCD. And what these bonds do, they look for a payoff within 15 years. But at the end of that payoff, they go through a pass-through where generally you'll see a nonprofit take 1% and then the developer can actually keep that and actually buy it out within the 15 years at a 10% construction value. If it's not bought out, it reverts back to the municipality. So what I had suggested was to take advantage of these bonds that are available right now. They could then fix up their community and revert that back to ownership of the, the constituents within the community. They don't have to go somewhere else. These are some of the bonds where people are making millions and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. I'll say billions because I can think of one person I'd qualify for that too. So I really encourage the council to encourage this in your correspondence. And as I said, I did send off an email to Royce to bring this up, but these bonds are available. I've been hearing about this from different people speaking to me. Thank you. Are there any members of the public in the room who would like to speak on item number? 13, and if you're on the Zoom, please raise your hand. There are three raised hands on Zoom, Madam Mayor. Okay, let's, let's go to the Zoom, please. Okay, the first one is Peter Anderson, followed by Janess Reynolds, and Peter, you're unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm a member of the First Presbyterian Church, and uh, we represent, I represent um, a large number of people who are in support of the Golden Gate Village Residence Plan for Deep Green Innovation. This is a struggle about self-respect, and it is a struggle about self-determination. As we know, Black people have been denied both in Marin for decades, sometimes by design and sometimes through ignorance. We also know that limited equity housing co-ops have been around for decades. We know they work. We're in housing authority has been around for decades. We know it doesn't work. They have failed at their job. I think it's time, we think it's time to support an idea that is beautiful in its scope. So we support, we urge you to support the residence plan to, to restore Golden Gate Village and the right to self-determination. It has been not denied to them ever since the dark ages of reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Janess Reynolds, followed by Lisa Bennett. And Janess, you're unmuted now. It's Janice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. Hi, um, um, I'm Janice Reynolds. I am the chair of the Marin Group Sierra Club. And I'm here on behalf of the Sierra Club to ask the council to send the letter in support to the Board of Supervisors. The intention and focus of revitalizing Golden Gate Village has always been to revitalize the housing by bringing it up to current state-of-the-art green standards, and most importantly, to create a path for Golden Gate Village residents to be in charge of determining their own future. After years, we are now at the finish line of act actualization 
actualizing the Golden Gate Village resident plan. It must be and can be completed, completed to realize its ultimate vision. There is only one right decision and that is to adopt the, the limited equity housing cooperative option. Golden Gate Village can become the new standard in revitalizing HUD housing. There is no re reason the Marin County shouldn't take that lead. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, the next speaker is Lisa Bennett, followed by Barbara Bogard. And Lisa, you are unmuted now. Great, thank you so much. My name is Lisa Bennett. I live in Sausalito. Um, I'm also on the strategy team working with the residents of the Golden Gate Village Resident Council in pulling, putting forth this plan for self-determination and uh, liberation from uh, oversight from the Marin Housing Authority. I really am grateful that you are considering uh, issuing this letter. It would be a wonderful show of solidarity and support for what the residents are looking for. Um, the residents have, have defined equity and wealth in far broader terms than simply financial gain. For the residents of Golden Gate Village who have never had a say in their future, real equity means something more basic, more valuable, and much more important. Yes, they build a little bit of financial equity with the limited equity housing co-op, but that's not what really matters. What really matters is that they get to live in one of the most beautiful parts of Marin County. They get to live in safe, comfortable units upgraded using state-of-the-art deep green technology. They get to pass the sh their share of the cooperative to their heirs. Most importantly, they get to decide and control their own future. They are no longer treated as children who can't be trusted to make decisions that affect their own lives. So please, uh, I encourage you to, to issue this letter and support the residents of Golden Gate Village. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Barbara Bogart, followed by Maureen Kroll. Barbara, you're unmuted now. Good evening. Uh, I want to, I, my name is Barbara Bogart, and I also work with the strategy team at Golden Gate Village uh, who helped the residents put together the current resident plan, which calls for deep green revitalization, which is long overdue, job training, and a path to equity and self-determination uh, through the establishment of a, of a land trust, a limited equity housing co-op, not a land trust, a limited equity housing co-op uh, at Golden Gate Village. You know, Marin Housing Authority has had its chance to manage Golden Gate Village and they have failed miserably. Uh, I don't know Mark Bell, but I wanna thank him for his comments. This has become a, an issue that people know about all over the county. And yes, there are still rats. There still is no heat. There's black mold. The living conditions are appalling for a county as wealthy as Marin County to allow our neighbors to live like this is unconscionable. And yes, we do want, the residents deserve a right to have a say in their future the way almost all the rest of us do. This is something we take for granted, but something they've never had. And the way for them to have a path toward determining their own future is through a limited equity housing co-op. We have a way to finance it. Everything is ready to go. We ask you to take the courageous moral stand and help support this plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Maureen Kroll, followed by Tom McAfee. Maureen? Oh. Sorry about that. Maureen, you're unmuted uh, now. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Maureen Kroll, a, a longtime resident of Fairfax, and I will keep this short. I just want to say that I agree with the speakers that went before me. And I want to lend my voice to ask, ask the council to support the plan. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tom McAfee, followed by Jess. Tom, you're unmuted now. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, Tom McAfee, resident of Fairfax for 10 years and another proud member of the First Presbyterian Church of San Anselmo. I'd like to support the sending of the mayor's letter of support by reading a letter of my own that I recently sent to the Marin Independent Journal. As reported in Richard Halstead's article of October 20th, under the Housing Authority's plan, a limited partnership would be formed to purchase the buildings and the land from HUD. The Housing Authority would be the partnership's general partner. Mike Andrews, is a housing expert hired by the HUD to advise the Housing Authority, told the commissioners, quote, what that means is that you will, you as the board of the Housing Authority would have still have oversight and control of what happens with the real estate, end quote. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that the same people, thankfully minus the former MHA director, Louis Jordan, the same people who oversaw years of neglect and degradation of the Golden Gate Village, once a shining example of how public housing should be done, would still be in charge. And that's supposed to be a good thing? It was only as through the tireless activism of the GGB Residence Council, aided by financial, pro bono, and moral support coming from various individuals, churches, and organizations that the MHA was prevented from raising existing structurally sound buildings and replacing them with high density structures, skyscrapers that would help fill the county tax coffers and line the pockets of the developers while completely changing the character and essence of this historical community. Is it any wonder that the residents want, as the Residence Council President Royce McLemore stated, to, quote, be in charge of our own destiny. In my opinion, a good start would be for the county to make the same $2 million endowment offer for the Residence Council's LEHC plan that they have apparently made to HUD. And maybe while they're at it, make an investment with some moral equity as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next speaker is Jess, followed by Jody Timms. Jess, you're unmuted now. Hi, Jess Lerner. Thank you so much. Um, and all the speakers who have come before, I agree with you completely and wholeheartedly. I fully support you sending the letter um, in support of the Golden Gate Village Residence Plan. And I also want to say, though, that for everyone listening who has been in support of this plan and the sending of this letter, please show up on Tuesday the 15th to speak up on this issue and to speak to the Marina Housing Authority and the supervisors to tell them what you're thinking and to share these comments then, because hopefully that will make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next speaker is Jody Timms. Jody, you're unmuted now. Good evening, council members. I. Um, want to speak in support of our town sending the letter to in support of Golden Gate Village, the residence plan for the pathway to ownership and certainly for the deep green renovations, which are badly needed. I spoke um, or I, I attended the Board of Supervisors meeting recently and listened to the presentations on both sides from MHA and also the resident council. Uh, I've been following this issue, um, this situation, as I think many of us have for months and years, and I'm in full support of the uh, plan, the residence plan, and I'd be uh, very grateful for our town council to send the letter in support. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see no more raised hands, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you everyone. Closing public comment on item number 13. And I did wanna note there's a typo in the letter, March, it says in the first line, it says March, 2002, it should be March, 2022. And I'm gonna, Barbara, did you have comments on the letter? Go ahead. Yeah, um, there's also potentially another typo in the letter that was not why I pulled it where, um, you're addressing it to the Board of Supervisors, but in the letter you're calling them commissioners, and the commissioners on the Marin Housing Authority are more than the Board of Supervisors. There are two members of the public, so you might want to change that to say supervisors or whatever's appropriate. The second to last line, yeah. which you commissioners should be um, supervisors? Since you're addressing it to the supervisors and you're right. seeing the commissioners. 
Um, I want to say that I'm fully aware that the Marin Housing Authority over the last few years has been less than uh, proper in their dealings with Golden Gate Village as far as the conditions there. I know that the renovations have started in some of the units and there are improvements in the few that they've started. I do know that there are some while I support the residents, there are some gaps in the plan that's been presented, quite significant financial gaps and uh, concerns that over time, the monies won't be there. The other concern is HUD has stated publicly that they would never accept this. So I'm not sure where that leads us, but the other piece and the reason I would like to abstain from voting on the letter is that, um, we usually do not get into our uh, adjacent cities or towns or the Board of Supervisors day-to-day -day business. And so I like to adhere to staying out of that. And that's why I would abstain from voting on the letter. I realize there are a lot of very valuable things said in it though. Thank you. Any other comments about the letter? If I may briefly, um, this uh, this request came to us, um, I want to say, several years ago. Um, Are you talking about the to develop the a resolution? This is different. To develop, but yeah, right. But right. It, but but I do believe that a lot of hard study and a lot of careful consideration and our own homework has been done between then and now, um, which uh, makes me feel comfortable making this statement to support the residence plan. Um, and I think at that time, if I can interject, there was a lawsuit and that is in settlement now. So that's what I think. The that, that was why, a big part of it as right. well. But time gone by, I think many of those questions and the concerns um, have been um, addressed. So Absolutely. Just a couple. And there's, it's not a policy, but I understand it's a standard of practice. And um, so I want to um, thank the members of the advisory team for Golden Gate village strategy team to help me write this letter and vice mayor who also provided some comments. Can I get a motion to approve this letter? Yeah, I'm happy to make that motion. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? All right, motion And passes. I'll abstain. Oh, one abstain. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to item number 14, discussing the electric bicycle, e-bike safety actions in Fairfax. Our town manager, Heather Abrams will present, I believe our public works director, Lauren Umbertis, as well as our police chief are here to present. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I just wanted to tee this up. Um, so as you, as you know, um, e-bikes and their use, uh, represent a potential environmental gain, getting people out of their, um, cars and onto the road safely, um, but also a number of potential safety risks, especially if e-bike riders are, um, not riding appropriately. And, um, we've seen recently some very serious, uh, collisions that have happened in Marin County. And we know of, um, uh, complaints here within town. Um, so council member Goddard and mayor Hellman have met with the staff a number of times and invited, um, Gwen Fro, who is uh, here online to present. Um, and, uh, so we'll be doing that in just a minute. And I just wanted to kind of make you aware that current actions that we are taking to address this include education campaigns that are being um, done by Safe Routes to Schools and others, and future actions um, include adding sharrows to the downtown area. You saw the map there. Um, this is all covered in the, in the staff report, um, but um, those sharrows will help to direct um, bikes and e-bikes in particular um, safely through downtown on the roads and not on the sidewalks. So we're looking forward to that and appreciate um, our public works director in making that um, a reality. 
And then um, in the future, you could also um, consider additional campaigns. There is a campaign which the um, graphics are included in this staff report going on right now, which will help. Um, and then we, we do have staff available um, for questions, both the public works director and the um, police chief are here as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gwen. I can't see her, so I don't know if she's really there. Gwen, oh, she's, she's right, right here. Her. Oh, and she's May not online. Great, Mayor. thank you. Mayor, Mayor, you want to introduce? Sure, Gwen Fro with Bike Safe, but Safe Routes to School. I know it's is, a it's a mouthful. Which is a, a division <laughs> or a department of Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Thank Actually, you. Uh, we are funded by the Transportation Authority of Marin and the programs that I oversee, education and encouragement, are under the auspices of Marin County Bicycle Got Coalition. Got it. Thank you for that clarification yeah. and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Michelle will go ahead and tee up our my slide presentation. And first, I want to acknowledge uh, both Heather and uh, Council Member Goddard and Mayor uh, Hellman for meeting with me just a couple of weeks ago to bring to my attention and to have the conversation about e-bike safety and extending the invite for me to be here tonight. And I'm thrilled to be here. I also want to acknowledge Council Member uh, Catrano, who serves on the Transportation Authority of Marin. And that is the governing board that provides direction and counsel over the Safe Routes to Schools program. So thank you very much for your service. Um, I, I want to start, this is an origin story, and it's very personal to Fairfax. So you're going to hear tonight a lot of firsts and something that we all share in being very, very, or should share in being proud of our town. So um, first of all, um, and that's before I delve into, of course, what we're all here to hear about, which is the e-bike safety. So if you could forward to the next slide, please. I wanna start with our mission or our goal is to create safe and healthy access to and from school for all students. And we do that by promoting walking, biking, carpooling, and riding the bus to school. What you will see in this slide diagram here is that equity is woven into everything that we do. All of our visions, our discussions, and our call to action is based upon this principle of equity. So for example, we recognize that not all families have the luxury and affordability to drive their student to school and pick them up midday. Many of these parents are working. So we work diligently to prioritize uh, walking and biking to and from school. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, we provide safety education. That's what I oversee. We provide many events for encouragement. Those cheer the families on to do more walking, biking, and carpooling and riding the bus. We work with our engineering team to structure our crosswalks, flashing beacons, uh, designing our roads or bike lanes to be safer. We also evaluate our program that's embedded in what we do. And we also work with law enforcement and that includes our local PD as well as our crossing guard program is considered a form of enforcement. Uh, we also work very, our ties are very embedded into the schools. The school administration works with us, teachers, PE teachers, physical education teachers. We work extensively with parent volunteers, student volunteers. We work with municipalities that includes Marin Transit, Public Works. Uh, we partner with all of those entities in what are called our task force meetings. And we invite the public in to give comments over their safety concerns for routes to schools. So that is the place and the form in which people bring their concerns. We discuss infrastructure. We talk about what kind of education is needed and we provide and brainstorm together solutions. Those projects are vetted and then the towns go out and advocate for funding for those projects. Next slide, please. Now, going back to the origin story, Safe Routes to Schools was founded in the year 2000 
by Deb Hubsmith and Wendy Callens. Deb Hubsmith unfortunately passed away a few years ago. She also was a Fairfax resident. Manor was the first safe routes to schools. It was the first semblance of a program, our little town here. Safe Routes to Schools and Deb Hubsmith went out to get funding because of the success that we had here in Marin County. And the program exploded from there. It is now a national program. That is significant. And I want us all to take a moment to really reflect on the impact that this town has had on a nation. Safe Routes to Schools, thank you. Safe Routes to Schools first had its teen program when I joined 15 years ago. I too am a Fairfax resident. I worked very closely with White Hill Middle School, Archie Williams, and a number of other schools around our county to launch the first ever teen program in this country. The teen program is still one of our shining examples. We have the highest percentage of students taking a green way to school, walking, biking, carpooling, and taking the bus to school in the middle school and high schools. And that is of the age where students can travel by themselves. So that is significant. However, it's because of these feeder schools such as Manor and our friends over in San Anselmo that we have built the success into the middle school and high school. In fact, Archie Williams is the number one percentage of students taking a green form of travel of all of their students in Marin County. Okay. Today, we are currently working with over 55 actively participating schools in Marin County, and that is grades K through 12. Next slide, please. Our engineering team, another Fairfax first, is the what we call the bike spine. This is the route that marks the pavement on our roads to school. So it provides guidance on where the students ride on the recommended routes to schools. So again, Fairfax was one of the first, was the first one in the county. This has now been replicated in Mill Valley as well as San Anselmo recently. Uh, David Parisi is the engineer who works on, who manages the Safe Routes to Schools program for TAM. And uh, he is the engineer that works with our town of Fairfax. Next slide, please. All right, a bit of levity. If you look at all of these shining examples from our international walk and roll to school day, and these are not all of the pictures here, you will see on one of these pictures, the uh, fire truck escort leading Manners kids to school. So a picture speaks a thousand words. And once again, I need to emphasize the little school that could Manor Elementary, and this is being replicated on this national day of action, October 12th, throughout the entire country. Significant. Next slide, please. Another fun fact is we work to this day uh, with White Hill Middle School teachers. Here are some of the posters that have been designed from student artwork. Next slide, please. All right, on to the education program. Last year, we teach second grade, fourth grade bike program, bike education, and every sixth grade for all incoming sixth grade students. We also have a share the road class for high school students as well. Last year, uh, we taught 12,000 students. That is a huge number of students. That was the highest number of students we had ever taught in this program to date. We were obviously making up for the pandemic the prior year where those students had missed a lot of our classes. At White Hill, we taught both sixth graders and seventh graders last year. Our instructors are League of American Bicyclists, excuse me, certified instructors. That means that we go through extensive education to provide the gold standard education to our kids in our county. And our classes are embedded into the PE curriculum. So these are not opt-in classes. 
these are taught as part of the physical education and it follows the California standards. Next slide, please. Classes that are coming up, our standard sixth grade classes will be taking place on November 16th and 18th, as we do every year at the beginning of the year in the fall, we teach at White Hill Middle School. Our classes are in two parts. There's a presentation part where we teach the students the rules of the road. We follow the DMV codes very, very closely. And we are starting to teach across the board the importance of e-bike safety without calling out the obvious fact that there are some who have it and some who don't. So we have to be very sensitive of not overly celebrating that some can afford an e-bike E bike and other families can't. But we are starting to really talk about that and listening to the students and getting feedback about some of the concerns that they have or some of the confusion that they have regarding uh, riding an e bike. Next slide, please. So that's part one. And then part two is where we teach bike maneuverability and handling, as well as we set up mock courses where they practice the rules of the road. Next slide, please. This past summer, we were trying to get out in front of the e-bike phenomenon that we're seeing. And I have to really bring to everyone's mind that this is a new technology. It is changing quite drastically. In fact, when I reached out this summer to the National Safe Routes to Schools Par Partnership, excuse me, and I reached out to the League of American Bicyclists, they had yet to have any curriculum developed specifically for e-bike safety. So we are chartering an unknown course here, uh, but we were trying to get out in front of it. So in August, we developed this flyer as a team, our instructors, and we delved into the research on what types of bikes there are, what the codes are, and I have to say there's a lot of confusion about it. But getting out in front and sending this out in the back to school notices, we wanted to alert parents that they need to do their own research on this. And the research about what type to a bike to buy and what is safe to ride is very confusing. It is hidden in many of the manufacturers' little um, statements. So they're not upfront with what their recommendations are. They're not upfront with the challenges of riding an e-bike. So there's a lot of confusion for parents in the community at large about what kind of bikes are safe for students to ride. So in anticipation of that, we got out in front and said, parents, we have always said, you have to be the best judge. We are not the be all end all of your student's education. You must decide what is the best fit for your student. And if they have the cognitive ability to ride an electric bike. We indicated what the rules of the road are on this flyer so that the parents would understand what the standards are for riding a bike of any nature. But in particular, since these are heavier and faster, it is of paramount importance that parents understand what they're putting their students on. We provided additional resources on this, and we upfronted this with a letter about our concerns with e-bikes in the attempt that we wanted parents to really take the lead on this kind of knowledge. Next slide, please. The, the principal of White Hill reached out and he said, you know, we want to provide some additional education. And again, another Fairfax first. We are piloting a dedicated e-bike safety class for students that own e-bikes. This is coming up this month. So this is going to be a two-part course and it's going to be provided for all grades. So for some of the students, it's going to be a reminder of our DMV codes. Then after they take that class, they're going to sign a pledge, both the students and the parents that will say these are the rules that they agreed to follow. We're going to use that as an opportunity to educate the parents on what types of e-bikes are out there and what the manufacturers are saying in their hidden documentation. These bikes do not have stickers on them the same way that we would have a sticker on a cigarette box. So there is a lot of confusion for the parents about what is safe for their student to ride. 
and the, the manufacturer that the student that is providing the bikes that the students are that are the most popular, we have this research here, um, they're not even considered an e-bike, some of them, because they do not fit the California vehicle codes. So then the second half of the presentation will be a values clarification. Uh, this is where we will work with the students to talk about their behavior. We will get the students to talk amongst themselves about why some of the students follow the rules of the road and why some think it's okay to still take off their helmet, which they know they should be wearing because we've taught them since they were in fourth grade, why they are running through a stop sign, why they are riding on sidewalks when we have told them that it's actually safer in most instances to ride in the middle of the street. So we're going to facilitate that conversation and we hope that the students talking amongst themselves non-judgmental from us, but for the students say, I follow the rules and here's why, that it will help to shift some of that behavior. Next slide, please. Additionally, Marin County Bicycle Coalition is coming out with a new program that was grant funded. It's called E-Bike Smart Marin. There are many components to this program, but if you've seen the first bullet right there, the major component of this that we're working on right now in partnership is a team bike uh, rider safety program. So this might be where we provide after school rides with teens. Uh, we are still flushing out what the curriculum is going to look like. Again, we've been contacting the League of American Bicyclists to get their input about what kind of specific e-bike education we should be focused on. Next slide, please. And in closing, I just want to say uh, that this community-based program, Safe Routes to Schools, that grew from a community-minded town is exemplary, and we're thrilled to be working with this town once again. Uh, we are dedicated to making your streets safe and sidewalks safe for all users of all ages. And typically what's good for children is good for our adults. Uh, we also are looking forward to working with the Fairfax Police Department. Uh, we have had a history of working very closely, closely with them in the past. They've handed out our educational flyers. And so we see that as a partnership going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Does anybody have any questions for Gwen? Go ahead, Councilman Kohler. Well, Gwen, first of all, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, it may be premature, but is there any movement towards potentially legislation for at least stickers on bicycles, like you mentioned, especially uh, the e-bikes that I think most of us think of with big fat tires that go really fast? Um, is there any movement towards legislation for requirements for stickers, just like there were for helmets for kids? Uh, what I can say to that is Marin County Bicycle Coalition Advocacy Director is in close contact with Cal Bikes, and they work very closely with legislation to advocate for the proper legislation and help provide direction on that. So we as a Safe Rest of Schools program that's not out of our realm of responsibility, but Marin County Bicycle Coalition has those contacts. Yes. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, just a quick question. Thank you so much, Gwen. That was uh, a great overview and story arc for Safe Routes to School. Um, the question I had, um, it's come up the last two months at the Transportation Authority of Marin meetings, this question around what communities are doing to share information about e-bike training and things like that. Um, it did come up at the last meeting that um, there wa was some initial tabling in San Anselmo, perhaps by Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Um, and I see here that um, in the staff report that e-bike Smart Marin program is currently in development. And I'm just curious um, what the what the timeline might be for getting out in the community at, 
as well as the, I, you mentioned the school programs about to start up. Um, but as far as community engagement, tabling, are we going to see more opportunities for that in the year ahead? Yes, we just had our first, first, um, let me just say one thing too, that there's the woman who's heading that up is on this call tonight, listening in to get the feedback and the questions from all of you. So she just recently joined Marin County Bicycle Coalition, and I've been working in collaboration with her on the curriculum, but we just started the brainstorming on that. And we did definitely host a table recently uh, to provide some education information around e-bike safety. Uh, so we are, our timeline on that with curriculum development is the beginning of the year. Thank you. I just want to commend you for how swiftly you've moved on this. This is a lot of progress in a fairly short amount of time. So thank you, thank Mayor. You. And again, you know, here we are with White Hill Middle School as one of yeah. the first ones piloting a new program with us. So uh, really appreciate the feedback yeah. on that. And as thank a mother you. of a White Hill student who writes his e-book, I'm particularly grateful. Um, so with that, we can open the public comment or if there's anything else. You want to add? Okay. Is there any members of the public in the room who please step forward? Thank you. And then if you if you have a public comment and you're on the Zoom, please raise your hand. Thank you. Deborah Benson, Cascade Drive, Fairfax. Thank you for hearing me. Um, there's a lawsuit right now on the East Coast by the parents of a, a, a child who was killed um, riding one of these e-bikes. She was going downhill. She had her friend on the back. And apparently they're, hard, they're heavy and they're harder to stop than she realized. Um, and I see these kids zooming. They're like little pocket rockets around town. Um, it's, it's, there's already been one death between a pedestrian and an electric bike, um, I think perhaps they should be licensed. I used to ride a motorcycle and they're like little motorcycles and I had to have a motorcycle license and these training courses are a great idea. Um, Fairfax has the ability to make uh, bike riding on the sidewalks illegal. I believe San Anselmo has done that, um, not just in, in reaction to e-bikes, it's been that way for a while. Um, yeah, I'd like to see them licensed. I'd like to see them not on the sidewalks. The idea of Sharrows on Bolinas and Broadway, you know, the ideas of uh, bicycles, kids going to school, having access to, to Broadway has come up in years past. They Kids shouldn't be riding, especially with these hot little electric bikes on Broadway or Bolinas. There's way too much traffic. Um, and there are bike spines in Fairfax, there are safe routes to schools from pretty much anywhere in town that do not involve riding in these, you know, high vehicle uh, corridors. So um, yeah, I'd like to see them not on those main streets and for the safety of the kids. Sometimes there's a kid on the front with a helmet and a kid on the back without a helmet. It's really scary, it's really scary and uh, whatever we can do to keep them safe. Thank you. Any other members of the public in the room? Does, I don't, not seeing anyone. Any raised hands on Zoom? Yes, Madam Mayor. We have three raised hands. Um, oops, sorry. The first hand is Linda Novi, followed by Zoe Rekas. Uh, Linda, you're unmuted now. Thank you for bringing this item to um, to the town for discussion. I think it's really important. And Gwen, thanks for your efforts. Uh, and I want to also applaud Fairfax Police for being on the streets, especially in the morning when there's a lot of bike traffic and for standing at the intersection of Broadway and Bolinas. I, I think that's a good reminder. Um, I do think there is a need for um, more education and enforcement of the rules. Uh, I agree with the prior speaker uh, that we, we should license bikes. 
Um, there needs to be some kind of identification of bike riders. And I think that would deepen their sense of accountability that um, they can't, they, they, they can be recognized and um, even insured by their parents on the bikes. I think that should be brought up. I don't feel like it's safe to walk on the sidewalks in Fairfax. Uh, I do, but there's scooters, there's bikes, there's skateboards. Um, and it's challenging as a driver because the bikes are zipping back and forth, cutting. And this isn't just kids. This is adults as well. Um, riding on the sidewalks when there's a bike lane. So um, I'm glad this is up for discussion. And uh, I also would suggest more signage in town, even some sandwich signs, um, more, more helpful information to help educate bike riders, e-bikes and regular bike riders. Thanks again for bringing this forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next speaker is Zoe Reckes from MCBC. You're unmuted now. Good evening, Zoe Reckes, Advocacy Assistant, Marin County Bicycle Coalition. I just wanted to quickly say thank you to Gwen for your great presentation there and for all of the hard work that you do with Safe Routes to School. I also wanted to thank all of our community members and leaders who are engaging in this conversation around e-bike safety. It's obviously something that's very important to all of our communities throughout Marin. Um, as Gwen mentioned, I was just hired on with MCBC to help develop our new program, e-bike Smart Marin. And I just wanted to put it out there, um, Gwen kind of mentioned this as well, that our timeline is to get this launched in early 2023. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with our community on this. So if there are any members who are wanting to get more information as we start to roll out this program, if you go to the Marin County Bicycle Coalition website, we have a form under eBike Smart Marin where you can sign up for updates um, as we continue to develop this. And again, I'm always very open to community feedback. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Safe Routes to School, Marin County, and you're unmuted now. Hey there, this is Tyler Randazzo. I'm the lead instructor for Safe Routes to Schools. I work with Gwen to develop a curriculum for our classes. And just wanted to say that we are seeing, you know, we're hearing a lot about things that are happening with e-bikes that are that are going wrong. And there's a lot of concerns about safety and, and we are very aware of that. We also wanna make sure that we sustain the momentum around kids who are doing the right things on the e-bikes. Um, we're recognizing a lot of really positive things that are coming out of kind of getting that um, freedom and, and developing sort of lifelong habits as cyclists. So we also wanna sort of just highlight that um, you know, I was I was riding around Mill Valley Middle School this this morning as kids were going into school, and I saw a lot of kids following the rules of the road, wearing helmets on e-bikes, riding appropriate speeds. So there certainly are lots of people um, following those rules, and we just need to make sure we're getting more of that education out there to the kids who maybe aren't aware of of, of those rules, which uh, Gwen and I are working very hard on. Thank you. I see no further speakers. Madam Mayor. Wonderful. Thank you again, Gwen. Thank you so much. I'll officially close the public comment on item number 14. Mayor, could I just ask that we post Gwen's presentation on the website? I think it was really helpful. Yeah, great suggestion. Noted. Uh, why don't we take a five minute break before item 15. Thank you. Thank you for taking your seats. Okay, moving on to item number 15, adopt ordinance amending chapter 5.54, just cause evictions of title five of the Fairfax town code and adopt 
ordinance amending chapter 5.55, mandatory mediation for rental increases of title five of the Fairfax Town Code. CEQA exempt from California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to section 15061B3 of state CEQA guidelines. Janet, are you taking the lead on this? I am. Okay. I am. Thank you. Okay. At our last meeting, when this was uh, heard, we uh, introduced both of these ordinances 5.54, just cause evictions, and 5.55, which is now known as the rent stabilization program. And the council um, introduced both sections with some modifications, and I have outlined those on the staff report. I did, however, make one error with um, part uh, B, and it was the previously deleted language in 5.54.060 units withdrawn from the rental market pursuant to the Ellis Act. And it was in the September 21st provision, it was a two, five, 10 year um, program. And I put that back the way it was, but in reality, the motion was for it to be a two, five, five. So the 10 year provision, <clears throat> and that would be, um, let me find it here. We'll it's on page 16. Yeah. It's item number C. C. Re rental of rental units within 10 years actually should be five. And then right under that, a landlord who offers a rental unit again for rent or lease within five years. So that was what the motion was. So that's my error. And with that, we made. Um, we made a few other the motion included a few other provisions. Um, replacing trouble damages, um, removing any stray references to board, um, cleanup, clerical cleanup, and um, the effective date would be 30 days from adoption. So that's 30 days from tonight, today, if it's adopted. And there is an implementation date though, that is different and that is, um, let me read it to you. We read it into the record last time. The provisions of this chapter shall not be implemented by the town of Fairfax until such time as sufficient agreements for implementation support, including but not limited to staffing, hearing, software, and outreach have been approved by the town council. Upon approval of said support agreements, the town council will set an implementation date by resolution. Um, and I'd also note that any of the fees would also need to be set by resolution at that point in time as well. And so um, with that, the two chapters, the two ordinances are ready for adoption. Thank you. And just for members of the public who may not have been here in the past, could you distinguish between effective date and implementation date, just for clarity, please? So effective date is um, normally 30 days from the date of adoption. That's when the ordinance, when the law, when the provision uh, becomes effective. But the town is not going to implement or start to accept any sorts of uh, petitions or any uh, do any type of um, uh, any of the provisions of the ordinance until such time as they have um, sufficient support to be able to implement the ordinance. And so it's going to come back to the council for an implementation date. Right. But from the vantage point or the experience of the landlord or the tenant, the rollback date the rollback goes date is into effect yes. December 3rd. Am I correct? February. If, should we pass it this evening? Okay. February. Um, well, the rollback date, right, but the effective date will be December 3rd. It'll be 30 days from today. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other qu questions before we go ahead? Um, so we've gotten a lot of emails over the last week or so, and some folks have talked to me. Something that, you know, I apologize I didn't bring this up sooner, but this is a question that kind of came to me more recently, and it it's a the question applies to both the just cause and the rent stabilization, and that is where someone has a lease, 
uh, let's say they have a year lease with a renter and they at the end of that year do not want to renew that lease, are they able to not renew the lease with no reason, just not renew the lease after a year under just cause or also the rent control? If Do both of those apply? And if someone doesn't renew the lease after, I don't know if they can do it at all, number one, right. but if they could do it, at least with rent control, could they raise the rent higher than what the cap is for the next tenant? You know, similar to what I, I guess I understand where there normally is rent control once the original person leaves, potentially the rent can be raised. So I'm not sure what happens in the case of a lease. Well, I think you have to clarify the question though, because if the circumstance is the tenant is voluntarily leaving. It, no, it's just the landlord. Or is the doesn't... landlord is exiting the market. Well, not necessarily exiting the market. So what I'm saying is I have a year lease and my landlord decides at the end of the year, I don't want to rent to that person anymore. Are they precluded from doing that? They would have to offer them the lease. Well, okay. They have to, they Unless have to there's just cause. Yeah. Okay, but just cause is dealing with eviction. So you're not evicting a person. You're just saying, I don't want to renew the lease. So it's... it's well, isn't that eviction? I mean, it's to me, okay, I have not had, okay, I was a renter for many years. Well, there have been times when a landlord did not want to renew my lease for a variety of reasons. They wanted to rent to somebody else, whatever. Okay. So that wasn't evicting me. That was just saying, give me 30 days notice. And you're, what you're saying, or at least what I'm hearing from members of the council, but I'm asking our attorney is that constitutes an eviction. Yes, if the tenant wants to stay. If the tenant wants to voluntarily leave, that's up to the tenant. Okay, so the lease really is... It doesn't matter if it's a the lease. The lease is meaningful days. for certain things as far as requirements to not make a mess and various things like sure. that. But the lease, as far as the, the term of it... When it's up, then presumably... You just have to offer it to this to the people that are there if the under both of these if the tenant doesn't want to leave yes okay thank you any other clarifying questions before we open public comment well it, that was that was an interesting question i just want to make fully sure that i understand the answer to it so in my experience a lot of times a lease is a one year lease and then it becomes month to month after that. It That's does. often the way leases it, are written. It, well, it, it automatically but, defaults to that anyway. Yes. So you're saying that even if the lease doesn't say it's one year and then month to month after that, if it just says it's one year, yes. it terminates, the lease is clear about that, that still there's a law somewhere California that says law. that it will mm -hmm. be, it will continue month to month after yes. that. Okay. And you said that was California law? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other caller friend questions before we open public comment? Okay, if there's members of the public who would like to speak on this item, please approach the podium. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Philip Salivary. I live on Scenic Road. It's a little, if you could just come a little bit closer okay. to the mic. I'm a 15 year uh, resident here. I moved here 15 years ago. I'm a landlord of a two unit uh, building. I op occupy one and I rent the other one. Today I spent three hours looking at all 38 pages and I would venture to guess that none of you folks up there on the stage have uh, either read the entire thing or understand the entire thing. You're, you have an attorney that you can ask questions of and I think, number one, it's unreasonable for you to expect me as a landlord or any other citizen to be able to understand this without hiring an attorney. Um, I, looking at um, the prospect of having to hire an attorney just to make sure, if this passes, just to make sure that I'm in compliance, which is going to add thousands of dollars to my uh, expenditures on the property. Um, secondly, um, I would just like to say that um, this is really difficult for me as a small landlord 
most of you folks, I know several of you up there actually are homeowners and you live in single family homes and you have no skin in the game when it comes to your livelihood. This is my income. It is my only source of income. I am below the poverty level. And uh, for you to pass this without taking it to the voters to me seems really, really uh, just kind of incredible to me. There are four of you standing, sitting up there, and um, it just seems incredible to me that you would uh, do that. I'm running short on time. Unfortunately, I had more I want to say, but it escaped me at the moment. And I hope other people are more articulate than I am and can say why this is not fair. And uh, you're putting the problem of uh, affordable housing and uh, availability of housing on the backs of small landlords like me. I, that's it. Hello, my name is Holly Beatty. I'm also representing Marin Freedom Rising. Please, three minutes, not two minutes. I am with the committee, with an organization, please. Three minutes. So we start at the beginning since I had to take 10 seconds of my time to ask you to change the clock. So at three minutes, please, and then I'll begin speaking. Thank you, thank you so much, Michelle. So the first thing that I wanna say is um, there's a statement in the uh, packet of information that you receive when you're gonna be uh, looking at speaking here in public in open forum time. It specifically says that the mayor and the town council will ensure that there's no um, derogatory statements and they'll keep the peace. Um, I've seen you do that before when people are attacking you personally. I didn't see anything like that happen when somebody was attacking the organization that I'm a part of. And I would like to call you on that. That caller that came in, she said something very negative and untrue about Marin Freedom Rising. And instead of so actually- you have a comment about the ordinance? Please don't interrupt me. Well, excuse you're not me, commenting you're using on my item time. I would like 10, minutes, 10 seconds back. You're not invited to interrupt me. I'm introducing myself so you can have clarity about the organization I am actually representing. I think that Perfectly you should- be Holly, though, just to be clear- Please the, stop the, interrupting just, me. Just to be clear, the mayor maintains order me. at these meetings. Well, this is not order, and neither was that question, and I would like my time back 15 seconds, please. So the organization that I am a part of is in favor of freedom of freedom, not discrimination and not aggressive antagonistic behavior, which you are both demonstrating to me now. So now that I've introduced myself and who I'm representing, I would like to speak. And so I should like to have two full minutes at this point, but that's okay. What I'd like to say is I am really in favor of rent control. I've been a single mother. I've been um, in many phases of my life where I've had money and I've been a renter. I've, all, uh, I've also been a property owner. And as somebody that was on welfare for some time when I had young children and I had just left a domestic violence situation. And even now I'm still a renter. I've been a renter for a long, long time. I'd also say that I am in favor of um, conscious, positive landlord behavior where there is no more than one to 3% increase across the board um, in um, there's a responsibility that's being done to make sure that the renters are taken care of. But this policy that you're passing does neither of these things consciously without also making the rental, the rental market diminished because you're putting an onerous um, new agency that's gonna create a huge tax burden you're um, taking away the individual choice of um, the landlords of who to rent to. You're even taking away from renters who they don't understand. You're taking away the ability for somebody that wants to rent to them to do so without an oversight agency saying it's okay. So they can't make any exceptions and take people on that seem to be a good, a good risk on balance, like has happened to me many times. So I just don't really think the public understands this policy very well, especially as you need a lawyer to understand it, the last pr uh, presenter said. And um, I think it should go back to the people and there should be a lot more transparency here. Thank you. 
and I will take your apology whenever you're ready to. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Susan Malloy, and I've had the opportunity to speak and to send emails um, several times. So I want to just thank everybody for what we're all doing. It's a, another example of democracy in action. And people should be, you know, proud of, of the council. Um, I was uh, one rent increase from living in a tent. Um, I was paying more than eighty percent of my income in rent, and I lived in unincorporated Contra Costa County where there were no protections. Um, and so I'm very happy that there are some protections that you've uh, you've worked on. Um, and public policy and taxation has usually been um, <clears throat> developed to help homeowners and real estate investors and very little public policy really to help tenants. And we, we do need protections. And we also should think about the fact that most people are not going to be able to afford a home in for, for sure in Myrna County, even in, around the US. And renting is, is a fine way to live. I mean, and, and uh, we shouldn't denigrate rent renters. So what protections you can make for stability and fairness um, and, and help is very useful. So uh, thank you again. Bye-bye. Good evening. My name is Susan Adams. I reside at um, Tamil Pius Road, Fairfax. Um, as you are well aware, I've been here a number of times speaking in favor of uh, adoption of measures for rent stabilization and just eviction protections. Um, and I'm here tonight to for s several reasons. First, to, I want to thank you for all of your efforts and attention since this issue first was raised um, earlier this year in pursuing these topics. Um, we've been quite diligent. And second, I want to thank the staff very much for all of their efforts in, in every directive you've given and the public has given. Um, suggestions they've pursued and put together some uh, good good ordinances for the consideration by the, the, the council. Um, so then I, of course, thank you for having adopted the, the, the first reading and I urge you again to um, again, once again, adopt um, these these ordin these proposed ordinances in, um, ahead of you to, in front of you tonight. Um, and um, as an aside, um, in response to some earlier comments, I am a homeowner and I am someone who may well have to or may desire to rent part or all of my home. And I applaud the efforts of having just cause eviction measures and rent stabilization measures in place so that I, who is not a real estate professional, can know that I would be doing something that's fair and just for everyone and is consistent with the policies of, this, of the town. So thank you very much. I don't think you, and if you need an attorney, get an attorney, but if you're ready, renting already, maybe you should have one to just kind of double check things anyway. So thank you. First of all, thank you so very much for remaining such a beautiful town of Fairfax. My first rental was 288 Cascade. So many years ago, I can barely count them. And I had the privilege of homeschooling a special needs son who successfully graduated from high school, from the Redwood High School. It was a lot of work. And through that, I would never have been able to do it without being able to have subsidies and assistance, not only for housing, but for teaching, for taking a strong position with a very difficult type of mind to reach. Spent many years after graduating from the Art Institute in doing resident artist projects around California and also integrating the stuff that we had learned from Marin County into different special education centers and places such as Casa Allegra. I came back in 2020, uh, cooperation with my daughter to begin to activate and bring back together the bridge between people and corporations and education, because those bridges are nonprofits 
and churches that reach the people directly and personally and know your name when you come in, like your favorite restaurant. And I found so many changes in things happening in so many different blocks in just being able to maintain my precious and held on to voucher to be able to not have to buy a house or change my social status, but to continue teaching and being a volunteer in the community and came back to uh, Northwest Marin, San Geronimo Valley. So I'm right now, uh, because of the COVID and different things that were happening in 2021, I transferred to Fairfax to the plaza, to the apartment there. And I'm working very carefully and closely with what has been very frightening for me, which is a commercial property along with the residents. And I need help from people who know and understand the live work situation at the plaza. I have been frightened, but yet joyful beyond belief to be back in this part of the world. And the, the, the holidays and the things that I've been able to see and how many of these programs and nonprofits have spread to just magnitude of helping people and doing wonderful things. And I'd really like to see somehow and be able to make sense of why it is so frightening to want to just pay your rent and pay all the utilities and keep your lease. And yet every time that you think that's what's happening, the owner switches some crazy little thing on you and starts scaring you to death about something that is worded in the lease, but you understood it one way for 20, 30, 40 years. And now all of a sudden this corporate owner has another version of a little sentence about utility accommodations or utility allowances. So I'm asking for help right now. I'm in a crisis trying to reach out and find out how to be able to keep my very first attempt to have my own little business in the world as an artist. I'm at 10E, Old School Street Plaza. I'm dealing with Asazi and Associates in a whole area I don't even understand after taking a rental fair and square, going by all the rules and having nothing but on property misunderstandings and crazy things. So thank you. I'd like to be able to keep a dialogue and know who's helping with that project up there. Thanks. Hello, Town Council. My name is Claire Armitage and my husband, Phil Smith and I own a two unit property in Fairfax. We found out last week and quite by accident that this ordinance would be up for vote today and have discovered that, thank you, that uh, many other owners of units and single family homes have also been surprised to learn that these changes have been in the works for some time. So due to the lack of adequate notification to all owners of rental income property in Fairfax, we request a delay in implementation of this ordinance so that workshops and consensus building can take place to fully explore the ramifications to all affected parties, including landlords, um, as we need to be he heard as well as tenants. Phil and I are what are often referred to as mom and pop landlords. We live in one unit and rent out the other. This is a property that is exempt under state um, bill AB 1842, I believe, and also in Berkeley. In Fairfax, we would not be exempt. So we ask the town council to exempt owner-occupied units due to the special nature of our relationship with our tenants, the fact that there's not an economy of scale, that oftentimes, and it is the case with us, we will be relying on this income as a part of our retirement, which will happen sometime next year. The town's ordinance offers protection to tenants over the age of 62. And so we ask that landlords over the age of 62 be exempted from the restrictions in the proposed ordinance. Those over 62 are often on fixed incomes, which will be the case with us. And these ordinance spell the death knell to those landlords who are retired or who soon will be 
especially the financial punitive 60% CPI provisions, which we request be eliminated and be restored to a 5% cap on annual rent adjustments for all properties that are not exempt. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, uh, Phil Smith, Claire's husband. Uh, as she said, uh, we're longtime small landlords. We'd like to see the same exemptions that exist in state law included in the town's ordinance, and that would provide a level playing field within the county. Otherwise, what we'll be facing is a disparity with nearby areas like Woodacre, San Anselmo, and that would be a considerable and unfair advantage. Over the many years we've owned small rental properties, we've done much of the maintenance through sweat equity ourselves, and that's made it possible to keep rents lower. As we age, this is getting less and less possible. Um, so an owner who occupies part of a duplex is in an especially vulnerable position. If they can't afford to maintain their property, they could be forced to sell. Like many landlords, and we've always charged very reasonable rents and had good relationships with the tenants, uh, especially during COVID, we kept the rents low and the reductions are still in effect. So we had intended with the agreement of our tenant to gradually raise our rents back to the pre-COVID level when Governor Newsom ended, ends the state of emergency next year. And that would help us recover some, not all of our rapidly rising costs, especially building materials and contractor labors, as I'm sure many of you know, those costs are out of sight. So we asked the town council to reconsider the rollback date of February 2022 after, until after further discussions. And with the shortage of rentals in Marin and relaxed laws regarding ADUs, the proposed ordinance seems a little out of step. So um, I wonder why people would want to go to the extent and expense of building ADUs when the rent control could be in place. So thank you for considering our comments. Um, thank you, Town Council, for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I am Maureen McManus. I am speaking to you on behalf of the California Alliance for Retired Americans, UFCW Local 5, North Bay Labor Council, and the DSA, who all are in support of rent control in Fairfax. I'm a semi-retired senior who has rented in Fairfax for over 30 years. I work at Fairfax Market. I have said previously, I'm lucky to be able to live and work in the town of Fairfax. My personal reasons for rent control have not changed since our many meetings. Um, three of my children have left Fairfax. Several of my coworkers can't afford rent here in town. And those that do live in town have many, many roommates, basically. Um, renters here in town are seeking protections and security. Now is the time to protect rent, Fairfax renters. Don't let working families, seniors, and young people get pushed out of Fairfax. I know there's a serious pressure coming from realtors, landlords, and some residents. We have all been working on this ordinance for eight months now. The council voted on these policies unanimously on October 11th. Fairfax is about to make history here. Please, let's stay on course. Vote yes on both ordinance. I want to thank all of you for your tireless effort in making these ordinances a reality in Fairfax. You took the lead in Marin. We are the first town to establish rent control. We have given hope to renters across Marin County. Thank you again to everybody. And please vote yes on both ordinances. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Towers, and I'm speaking in opposition to the, to the ordinance. First, I'm going to say a little bit about the underlying economics of it. I'm not a landlord here, but I am in San Francisco, and I don't know why the city, would, the town here, would want to emulate what they've done. It has been a failure for tenants and a failure for landlords. And the underlying reasons are that they simultaneously put a burden on the landlord to provide a, a benefit to society. So the idea that because rents you want to control rents, you put all that burden on the landlord. It should be shared across everybody. You don't reach into the grocer's pocket when, when there's inflation. You, you share it among everybody. So what has happened in San Francisco, they, they suppressed building housing. So there's a shortage of housing 
and, and they have the rent controls, it raises it, it creates an artificial economy and it creates some very bizarre situations in San Francisco. It is not progressive politics, rent control. Progressive is looking forward to what the town is gonna to look like 50 years from now. If this was in place in the 70s, none of these apartments would exist. They exist because there are private investors who invested in that to provide the housing and to make money in turn. I'll provide an example. One particular thing that I saw on the ordinance that is problematic is the primary residence distinction, the, the definition of it. There is none. There are no details about what it takes to be a primary resident. And I experienced this in San Francisco with a tenant who doesn't live in the, an apartment, hasn't lived there for 20 years, and they have no requirement to live there ever. They sublet it out to somebody else and make money off of it. That's what would happen with the way that primary residence portion of this is written. There are no definitions about, no requirements for people to live there. It's just vague terminology, very much the same as it is in San Francisco. So I would hope that the town council would reconsider doing this and take a hard look at the economics behind, behind the town and also for individual landlords. Thank you. I'm short and old, so I get more time. Sorry. Um, I did send emails last month. My name is Diane Redden. We purchased three duplexes in 2008 and at that time made substantial repairs to the three. During COVID, we did no rent increase. We did increase rents this year um, because we need to cover our expenses. Say so your housing proposal would severely affect our interest in making any capital improvements on our 35 year old units. We couldn't do solar. We couldn't do electrical units. We've got gas in ours. And we could not in any way conserve water and reuse it because this takes money to do and there wouldn't be any. So um, I don't think there's a need to impose additional requirements. If the town of Fairfax desires to control rents for select groups, the town should use direct subsidies to implement this policy. It is not fair to place the entire burden of this policy on the backs of rental property owners. Hi, my name is Erica Milligan. I'm a homeowner here in Fairfax and I'm in support of the rent control measures. I urge you to vote yes on both ordinances. Um, I'm a mom to a senior in high school who's taking a non-traditional path. And I'm conscious that if he's gonna launch and have an independent life, he's gonna have to leave. Um, and and I know as a, as a young parent, I took advantage of the rent boards in Oakland so that, that I could have security in my home. I own a home because I'm privileged, because my parents were able to contribute to the down payment. And, and because I had a mortgage, I was paying less per month than a number of my friends were paying every month in rent, in rent right? So it's not like you can't, you can't grow up and buy a house anymore because it costs so much. And, and I'll be honest, I don't know that I will have the money to help my son purchase his own home. Right, it's really important that we create these safeties and these protections. They're public health issues. It is economic, but I, I'm not aware of any other business where where the owner of the business is guaranteed a, a an income from their business. I think it's more important to protect protect the renters. Make sure that we have a community that supports itself. That we're ensuring housing stability for public health. Um, and creating opportunity for everyone. And, and as we saw in the safe routes to schools, Fairfax has an opportunity to impact the entire county. The choices you make tonight are gonna change people's lives. And I encourage you to, to vote yes, to continue the strong work and remember the eight months of voices that have shown up. There's been some loud voices against these measures, but there's been eight months of people showing up at these meetings, telling you their personal stories, getting time off work, showing up with their babies, getting rides here, like coming forward to tell you how important this is. So just remember all of those voices as well. Thank you.
Hello, council members. I'm John Pope. I've been a resident here with my wife for over 50 years and uh, have raised two sons here, uh, both first responders in Marin County. Uh, we are, Ann and I are also landlords. And so on the one side, my son's having difficulty finding a place to live, us having to help them. I understand the controls and the stabilization as a concept and something that's important for the Fairfax community. But also I'd like the council to consider those small uh, investors like the Smiths and ourselves. And I think there's a lot of us that worked very hard, invested our money in our community, supported our community, myself with youth organizations, my wife through uh, church and Marine Interfaith Council. Uh, as members of this community started our property and our business with the idea of retiring on that income. And many of the clauses and the restrictions you have put in, I think lump us in with corporate owners rather than considering that we are also community members. We contribute to the community heavily and uh, it's patently unfair to treat us the same. Thank you. Good evening, uh, members of the Fairfax Town Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I just am here in strong, my name is Susie Dershowitz. Um, I'm a resident of San Rafael and I'm a tenants rights and affordable housing attorney and policy advocate. Um, and I'm here in strong support of the rent stabilization and just cause ordinances that you're considering tonight. Um, thank you for the bold action that you've already taken um, and urge you to move forward um, with this historic um, action that you're planning to take tonight. Rent stabilization and just cause are proven policies um, that have worked in many, many cities to stabilize low income communities and communities of color who are disproportionately renters, keep people in their homes. Um, so just thank you so much. And um, I hope that you take, take this important action and inspire the rest of Marin County to follow in your footsteps. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is John Bourne. I'm a local resident. I'm here today in um, support of my next door neighbor who um, just lost her husband. Uh, she, she is and was a um, preschool teacher in Marin for about 25 years. And she raised her two kids here. And uh, with the passing of her husband, she is scared to death that uh, her landlord is going to raise her rent and she's going to have to leave the community that she loves so much. Um, so I just wanted to come in support of this ordinance in support of people like her, who you can see her talking to everyone in town and on roller skates. And um, these are the pillars of our community and, and being scared to be kicked out of your whole region in which you live. That's unfair. That's horribly unfair. Um, making less of a return is not good either as a business person. I understand that. But when I compare the two as her neighbor, I really, really feel bad for her. And I understand the, the anger that many of the landlords feel, but I'm very much in support of people like her being able to stay in the community. Um, so thank you. Good evening, council members. Uh, I think you all know who I am. My name is Kurt Reese. This is baby June, eight weeks old. Um, I'm a San Anselmo renter, a co-chair of the Marin chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America and a co-chair of our campaign to establish rent control in Marin, studying right here in Fairfax. We've been hard at it for over a year. Um, if I could have the four minutes allotted to organizational representatives, that would be appreciated. I'll try not to use it all. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity tonight to thank the council for taking this courageous step to be the first town in Marin and the smallest town in the entire state of California to pass rent control and begin treating as a human right and not simply a market commodity. Uh, we know that you're hearing from plenty of landlords and realtors whose profits and control over their rental units would be ever so slightly curtailed by these ordinances. So I just wanna take a moment to remember why we are doing this. 
Fairfax is approximately one third renters with over 1200 families or households who rent their homes. Under existing state law, these 1200 families have virtually no control over their ability to stay in their homes. Their rents can be exorbitant, their rents can be raised an exorbitant amount up to 10% each year, and they may be evicted for little or no reason given the, the many loopholes in the so called Tenant Protection Act at the state level. Many of those 1200 households are struggling simply to make ends meet and afford the roof over their heads. 48% of them are rent burdened, paying more than 30% of their income on rent. 28% are severely rent burdened, paying more than 50% of their income on rent. 71% are some form of low income with 36% being extremely low income, making less than 30% of the area median income. Uh, these are seniors on fixed incomes, young people attempting to start their lives and working families struggling to juggle the ever increasing costs of rent, childcare, car payments, health insurance, groceries, and more. June's childcare is gonna be our rent. Again, we're gonna be paying rent twice just to have one child in this county. Um, we've all heard these statistics multiple times now. I reiterate them tonight so that we can remember what is concretely at stake here tonight. We have a choice uh, between treating these 1200 families with the dignity and respect that we all deserve by providing some modest form of housing security and mitigating their risk of displacement, or we can keep them in a constant state of precarity, never knowing whether Fairfax is a home where they can put down or keep their roots or a way station that they're forced to leave, all for the sake of making sure that a very small, relatively speaking, number of landlords and realtors can maximize their profits or maintain total control over their units, regardless of the human cost. Finally, I'd like to argue briefly against the suggestion that the town council is somehow unable to make this decision. The town council members are elected representatives of the residents of Fairfax, elected specifically and explicitly to make decisions democratically on behalf of the town's residents. Most California jurisdictions have passed local rent control ordinances and just, uh, just cost protection ordinances through their town or city councils. There's no reason you can't. I urge you all to stay the course and make history tonight by voting yes on both ordinances. Thank you. That's a hot act to follow. <laughs> My name is Laura, and I've come up here one time before. Oh, I didn't. My name is Laura, and um, I live here in Fairfax in an affordable housing uh, building. I raised my two children here. I'm a grandmother here. I've been a caregiver here for everyone's loved ones for almost 40 years, caring for people. And um, somehow I was able to make it back in the day when I was raising my children. But now my daughter is paying 70% of her income as an essential worker. Essential workers need this. They really do. Caregivers, teachers, people caring for our children, people preparing our food. All these people are an important part of this community. And if they can't stay here, they can't live here, they don't have any control over the, their rent and someone can just keep raising it, where do they go? This is, this is about stopping people becoming homeless. We have an issue. We have too many people becoming homeless. This is something I urge you. I urge you to take a courageous stand and pass rent control and just cause eviction, strengthen it, because people matter. People like me matter in this community because we do important work and have done it. I urge you to do this. Thank you for hearing me and thank you for being here. I'm Milan and I've lived in Fairfax for 47 years. I do not have income property. However, I am a real estate agent. And I have clients that have it in this count in this town. And the figure that you're using to compute the rent control is so extreme that we're going to start to see landlords that can't paint their buildings. We're going to start to see unmaintained properties. One of the things that's nice about Fairfax, when you drive in on Sir Francis Drake, you see income properties and they all look nice. If you've driven through Berkeley, you don't see that anymore. 
too many places where the landlords can't afford to keep the properties up. It's not a matter of simply rent control. You can have rent control, but the limits that are established are so severe that a landlord is not going to be able to afford to maintain a building when they're paying five to eight percent for people to come in and paint it and the cost of living is going up eight percent when their property taxes go up two percent of the value a year over the last several years the cost of living increase has been to well one to three percent if you take 60% of that, you can't afford to do anything to your property. So if we want a nice town that's well-maintained and tenants don't wanna live in what might end up to look like slum properties, then you need to readjust the figures you have and make it more fair to everyone. And I do wonder if all the landlords were notified of, of this ordinance over the last eight months. You know how many landlords there are. I saw the numbers on your, um, on the information you sent out. So you, I don't know if they were all notified or not. Many of them don't live in the town. So how would they know what's going on here if they aren't notified? Thank you. Hi, good evening council. My name is Megan. I'm a renter here in Fairfax and I'll keep my comments brief because I've been here many, many times before speaking to you writing emails, um, including at a forum uh, more than a month or two ago that I believe was specifically for input from landlords and, and real estate um, organizations. So I just wanted to remind folks of the reality of, of being a renter in, in Fairfax. I have a job, I serve the community, I work at a nonprofit and pay about 33% of my income in rent. Um, I wouldn't qualify for any subsidies because my income is is higher than most of the um, most of the subsidies were that would be available. So if my rent were to increase, um, what it is now, it would be you know could be ten percent, which is around three hundred dollars. And I know for sure that I'm not getting a raise next year. So I'm I'm just thinking about my stability, the stability of my neighbors. I've had the privilege of working on this campaign for gosh, like almost a year now. And I heard so many stories like mine, worse than mine from neighbors, teachers, artists, musicians, people that make our town really special. And I'm just asking for some stability and the ability to plan for rental increases and knowing that my landlord would still be able to raise the rent and, and make a profit there. So. Thank you for considering this over the time that you have. And I really, really urge you to vote yes and adopt this ordinance tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Burke. I'm not a Fairfax resident, um, but I'm a real estate agent that specializes in the sales of apartment buildings and I've represented many Fairfax property owners. Um, before I go off script here just for a second, my wife and I this last week sent out a mailing to all owners of uh, residential uh, rental properties in Fairfax because we were afraid that they weren't aware of what was going on. And the phone calls that we've received back in the last couple of days indicate just that. They don't have a clue. They don't, they don't even know it's on the agenda tonight. Some of your speakers here tonight are here because of the letter I sent out, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the first thing I ever heard of it. Um, anyway, it might be better handled or better notified before you make a vote on such an important matter. A couple comments in general, if I could. I previously sent all of you uh, a couple long emails outlining my thoughts on rent control, but rent control doesn't work. Um, especially what's enforced over such a small geographic area. It, it, to be considered, it must be done over a larger area, like the statewide, preferably countywide at a minimum. It also needs to be decided by the voters, not, not the town council, I'm sorry. There are a few things economic, economists agree upon. The one thing they do agree upon is rent control. It doesn't work. Next to bombing, 
Rent control seems to be in many cases the most efficient technique so far known for destroying cities. This according to economist Ashar Lindbeck, the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee for many years. With rent control, tenants stay in... May, may I continue? Oh, thank you. Uh, with rent control, tenants stay in place to enjoy the lower rents. The turnover rate for these apartments becomes zero. This essentially takes these apartments out of the rental market. It reduces the overall supply of apartments available for rent. The lower supply puts pressure on rents to rise above where they would normally on the available apartments that are not under rent control or in the immediate surrounding areas, say San Anselmo. This is supply and demand economics 101. Rent control actually has the effect of raising overall rents. Yes, higher because rent control creates a two-tier rent system. There are those cheap price stabilized apartments that rarely turn over because who would who'd give up such a good deal? Then there are the uncontrolled apartments in Fairfax and the surrounding areas where everybody else must fight over or bid up the prices. Rents rise. The negative effect is even greater when applied to a small community instead of the market at large. Property values drop dramatically in areas of rent control. Investors will not buy in that market. Why would they? They'll buy elsewhere. The cost of enforcing and managing rent control could be huge. It's one thing for a city like Berkeley or San Francisco to take it on. It's quite another for the town of Fairfax to do it. I believe these controls are so far reaching that you will most certainly find it also challenged in the courts should you pass it. Please reconsider passing a local rent control. Leave it to the voters if you want to consider it. Thank you for consideration. Okay, good evening, Council. My name is Chris. I'm a lifelong Fairfax resident and a member of the uh, Marin Democratic Socialist of America. So I'm gonna push back on the idea that this process has not been democratic. We live in a representative democracy at all levels. Um, the five council members in front of us have been democratically elected. I'm, many of us in here have voted for them. Uh, it is ridiculous to put forward the idea that our local leaders cannot make decisions without ballot measures. They have the vote of the people. Many have been reelected, a consistent vote of the people. They are in front of us right now and have listened without fail until the wee small hours of the morning, month after month after month. Thank you the council members for doing your due diligence and giving the majority of your constituents a voice that they have never had before. Please pass the ordinances in front of you and make history tonight by putting the lives of the people of this town we all love in front of the profits of a few. Hi, Todd Greenberg, Bolinas Road, Fairfax. I appreciate everybody being economically impacted here. And I think if you're gonna make a fair decision and if you're going to do what all these people are urging you to do and do your elected responsibility, you need to consider the cost for all the people, not just a set of the people and for the town. I think you are creating a huge, huge liability for this town that you haven't provided funding for and you are going to create, as you can see, if you wanna take a drive with me over to Berkeley, which has long had rent control, an incredible amount of squalor. What should be happening, in my opinion, for the benefit of all the people who do want lower rents, is there should be policies put in place with a carrot rather than a stick, rather than an authoritarian rule, rather than a socialist revolution that happens in Fairfax because a small group of people decide upon it. There should be policies put in place for the development of more supply that would allow for lower rents. 
because guess what? Fairfax has more great housing and a better place to live than other places. But instead, what's gonna happen if you do this, there's gonna be big costs to the town. There's gonna be big costs to landlords that aren't gonna be able to afford it. As Michael said, people are not going to invest in properties. They're not gonna maintain their properties. And in five or 10 or 15 years from now, this town is gonna to look like fill in the blank. Instead, and I'll tell you one more thing. I have a friend who's owned property here for years. And he has told me Fairfax has always been a difficult place to rent. Sometimes he can rent and other times he will not be able to rent and he'll have to lower his rent. And by the way, San Francisco is now one of the most rapidly dropping rental market costs in the US. It's dropped over 8% in the last, I don't know what, month or two months, and it's in the paper. So I don't know how you propose to repeal the free market here. I want you to be fair to everybody, and this should go to a vote. Hi, council members. My name is Kyle Amsler, and I'm a renter, volunteer with Marin DSA, and the Child Life Specialist. As a child life specialist, I am an essential healthcare worker working with children receiving palliative care and hospice care throughout Marin and the larger Bay Area. Marin is experiencing an urgent housing crisis and Fairfax has the opportunity to lead Marin in ensuring that our children and all people in our community have access to adequate eviction protections and affordable stabilized rents. Housing insecurity is a public health crisis. Evictions and housing instability can lead to long-term negative impacts on the physical and mental health of children and adults. Research shows that women, people of color, people living with disability and chronic illness, and families with children are at especially high risk for eviction. In the past several years, evidence of the detrimental effects of eviction and displacement on health has grown, with analyses demonstrating negative impacts on a variety of metrics ranging from birth outcomes to mental health hospitalizations to all-cause mortality. Children raised in unstable housing are more prone to hospitalization than those with stable housing. Mounting research illustrates that even the threat of eviction can exact a physical and mental toll from child tenants. Healthcare workers have always been essential in keeping our communities safe and healthy and advocating for public health. We know that stabilizing rents and preventing evictions will be key to creating long-term public health equity in Marin. As a volunteer with Marin DSA, I have been texting the over 650 Fairfax residents who signed our rent control petition to come out and speak at these Fairfax meetings throughout the past eight months. Every meeting I have received texts back from folks who have been displaced and had to move out of Fairfax. Just today, I heard from three more people who have been forced out of Fairfax while texting. Rent control protects tenants from excessive rent increases by creating a schedule for reasonable and gradual rent increases while ensuring that landlords receive a fair rate of return on their investment. Our collective future depends on the health and well being of renters, too. When renters thrive, our families, communities, and local economies thrive, too. Thank you. Good evening again, Council. My name is Joe McGarry. I'm a Fairfax current and longtime renter. Um, and I want to thank you. Tonight, you'll make history by taking the most significant stand with the working class of any elected body in Marin over the last many decades by passing rent control and the strongest just cause eviction ordinances in the state. These ordinances will be the model for the rest of the county and have the potential to provide housing security for tens of thousands of people from Novato to the Canal to Marin City. When we talk about who will benefit from these protections, we are speaking of members of the global majority. We are speaking of the working class and their families. We are speaking about young adults trying to get started. And we are speaking about our elders on fixed incomes. In a county as rich and as white as Marin, we are speaking of our most vulnerable and most historically marginalized people. People who for decades have had policies designed to keep them from thriving. We are speaking of people who need your help. They need this piece of policy to survive here. They don't have generational wealth. They won't acquire property. They work hard just to maintain their presence here and all they ask for is a chance. A chance to share space and community here in Fairfax as the cost of rent is pushing them out. Since the summer of 2020, 
I've watched you as a council work hard and try and find that entry point to creating equity, specifically racial equity in this town of ours. It has been beautiful at times and it has been ugly at times. The work is hard. This was the type of significant work we had thought the ResJ could be a part of and collaborate with you on. Creation of policy that is impactful and will stand the test of time to create real change. This is the moment. This is your first huge step on a path to equity. Take that step. I know you can. Adopt the ordinances tonight and protect the renters of Fairfax. Thank you. Good evening, Council. I'm Lucy Hollingsworth. I'm a senior attorney with Legal Aid of Marin. My focus is on housing and homeless policy. Um, you've received many letters from us um, and many comments. So I'm just gonna work off the cuff tonight. Um, as far as notice, there's been over six articles since February um, about Fairfax's discussion on rent control in the Marin IJ, in the Pacific Sun, in Marin Voices. There's also been at least six noticed public item agenda items since February. So there has been plenty of notice, but I'm glad all the landlords are here tonight because we want, there's room at the table and we want you here. Which leads me to the next point is that, you know, for the Fairfax landlords, we understand that there are, is gonna be some extra administrative burdens. Um, that Legal Aid of Marin have already set in motion informational materials. We are planning outreach. We're gonna have a monthly in-person free legal clinic that landlords are welcome to come to. We have always done this. 1482, we had the same problems. It was complicated, it was new. We want landlords to thrive. Without tenants or without landlords, we obviously don't have tenants. So, sorry, it's past my bedtime. <laughs> I think that's all I got. We hope to get this passed tonight and we hope to continue to work on implementing this. <clears throat> with all the landlords involved at the table. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Billman, and um, I'm one of the people that just became aware um, via Michael Burke's letter. I'm sorry if that meant I wasn't keeping up in local news articles um, or otherwise. Um, and I think it's just evidence of the fact that locally there's been really strong, um, mobilization, um, among renters and landlords have all been put into one bucket. And I personally resent being put in the bucket with, um, the corporate and out of town landlords. I live here. Um, I debunk the myth about profits. 50% of my income goes to covering my housing costs. I'm a single mom. I work for a nonprofit. The only reason I have been able to buy a house, no generational wealth, none of that, is because I was able to buy a property that had a studio apartment over the garage. Um, I'm, in, I'm in support of capping rent increases. It is the administrative burden of needing to get on top of local regulation, on top of state regulation, and knowing legally what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm hoping legal aid can really help me with that. That frankly has me so skittish about this that I'm inclined to just remove that unit from being in the rental market and just use it for our family, which I know is not the goal here. I've also been renting at below market rates. I enjoy a great relationship with the people that um, have lived there, that have chosen to leave of their own accord. And I, I'd love that to continue, but if I need to be hiring a lawyer to make sure I'm, I'm covering, you know, all these different steps of an ordinance, um, I, I think it's too much risk um, for me to take on in terms of time, um, mostly time um, to stay on top of all of it. So I would encourage you to 
to think about teasing apart how you treat like the the corporate and the multifamily and the out of town landlords from the ones who live here um and um i don't know how you do that maybe it's in the implementation phase if you're passing it but um something i hope you can consider and i'm i'm committed to um participating in in trying to help it be productive Mark Bell, Fairfax, can I have three minutes, please, because I respect the California appellate court ruling. Uh, just a couple of clarifications. Most council members get elected with around 25% of the vote. It's not an overwhelming majority. It doesn't elevate them to some incredible status. They're here and they sit up there and it's not a fun job. I think like a lot of things that are well-intentioned, part of this is really good. Part of it's probably, yeah, part of it's rather draconian. I don't care how many times, I don't read the IJ, they blacklisted me. Why should I give them any money? I wouldn't know that this was going on if I depended on them. So you have 1,200 rental units. You know who the landlords are. What was the outreach? You spent dozens, if not hundreds of hours talking to every other group about it. Did you have set up a meeting with landlords so you could tell them what you were looking at and what the issues were? How many houses in Fairfax are unoccupied? There's 61,000 unoccupied units in, in San Francisco alone. Just just came out that are not being rented. 61,000, how many here? And the other thing, you know, I noticed when I was trying to get through your 40 pages or whatever it was, 72% of the 1,200 rental units are between extremely low and low rates. Yet you want to penalize the people who've been renting these units out. And that I don't understand without talking to them. It's not like they're most of them are trying to gouge the renters that they have. So I think you really need to take into account their side of it. I mean, part of this stuff, you know, like I said, you know, it looks good to me, but I'm not an attorney. But I was looking at this like relocation for short-term relocation. Uh, the landlord has to pay a renter if they have to move out for under 30 days, almost $11,000 for a family of four. You know, that's like, and it's over $100 a day per food. Can't they cook? They're, they're not getting their food for free in a rental unit. Why is that even in there? You know, it's just like units, if they're withdrawn within two years, you have these triple penalties. What if you've gotten it for a family member who's elderly? You've done a bunch of renovations, spent X amount of dollars, which of course will then kick in, uh, you know, the electrification. So now you've spent all this money on that. Uh, you've gotten it for your mother or for someone else and they die or they have to be committed to a, to a senior home because you can't deal with them. There's nothing in here, in, in your 40 pages, about that possibility. And that's a definite possibility. If you're moving somebody out to move in a family member, they can just drop dead. And then you're going to have triple damages because you went to put the unit back up and it happened within a couple of years. So I'm just, you know, I'm saying like, a, you know, as I said before, some of this is good. My, you know, we had like uh, our Afghan neighbors got priced out of their apartment. I think they got their rent raised like $800 in a year per month. Something has to protect that from happening. But I think you really need to, to make history tonight and talk to the landlords and come back with some, some changes on some of the policies that are in here. That's all I have. Hi, um, my name is Wendy Botwin, and 
I'm asking you and urging you to please pass these two laws tonight. This is not a new issue at all. And most people know that. My years of regularly coming to town council on my own and alone during my 11 years of living in Fairfax until I was pushed out with nowhere here to go. I was saying over and over again for many years, there's a housing crisis not being addressed or treated like one. And then I met multiple times with a past town council member years ago with two other friends. And then it was still given no attention until finally in 2019, my personal story inspired this town council to pass the very first laws. Landlords tonight are speaking at the last moment. And I feel like from what I'm hearing, they seem uninformed and maybe haven't fully read the proposed ordinances that are being passed. As there's a process to appeal if landlords need more money for repairs or any other issues. I'm also still concerned for the unregistered units and how these laws will affect them. I've been watching rents double and double and double in just a couple of years, every couple of years. So as I've said for years, landlords and tenants need to be educated when these laws are passed. Please, please make history tonight so we can celebrate and may it inspire the rest of Marin for real housing equity and home stability by passing laws themselves. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah London, lived in town 25 years, had a business in town 15 years and been a landlord for 38 years. We are of modest means. Um, we have very few units. We've worked ceaselessly and thanklessly for many years providing housing. We are not unreasonable in any way, form or manner. We have gone years without raising anybody's rent, which has come back to bite us in the ass. And um, town, the Fairfax had an obligation to notify the landlords. We were not notified at all. We have not been properly notified. Um, and, and where is the equity in this? It's all tenant slanted. Now tenants out there in here, we are not your enemy. Mom and pop landlords provide the majority of rental units for this town. What are you guys thinking? This is insane. Uh, and you want to have Berkeley manage it? Really? I mean, if, like, like someone else said, have you seen Berkeley lately? Um, rent control does not work. It's proven over and over again. I, it's, it's astounding to me that you guys haven't done more research on this. Fairfax is a teeny tiny little town. We don't need this. It will destroy the town. Free market works. That's what works. If we put something on the market and we can't get the rent, we lower it and we lower it. And we, not that we're actually overly marketing. We do not overcharge for our, our places. We make modest increases because we have to. We cannot afford to maintain, repair, or God forbid, improve our units a teeny tiny bit. There's, we are not maximizing profits in any way, form, or manner. We are breaking even. If anything, we're looking forward to maybe an appreciation on our property should we ever have to sell or we want to retire and sell. We, it's not about that. I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Um, so um, the, it's hard enough for us to break even and operate with our under current conditions. The, the inflation has gone nuts. This 60% of CPI is unsustainable. We can't do it. And I don't really, honestly, you cannot, this is not a dictatorship. You guys cannot sit there and jam this down our throats. This is something that I, I don't believe the town council has a right to make this decision in any way, form or manner. This has to, this, and Cal, California already has rent control. Um, it, it, this has to go to a vote. That's all there is to it. Um, we don't need further restrictions. Marin Apartments, that's how we found out about this, plus another landlord let us know. Um, this is, Marin Apartments said this is the most restrictive rent control and just cause clauses they have ever seen. California Apartment Association has reached out to you guys to try and talk to you. And they told us, you shut the door in their face. That's what, the, that's what, 
they've told us. And that's, that is not, there's no equitable, there's no, this is not equitable in any way, form or manner. It's completely tenant biased. We support reasonable rent, rent increases for tenants, but- If you could wrap up. Yeah, I will. Thank you. So it will destroy Fairfax. No one will wanna invest in this town. Housing supply will go down. Quality of the housing will plummet. No one will want to be, no tenant, including my husband and I are gonna put our, our units on the market. And we don't have many. But if all the landlords do that, you will feel it. And thank um, you. So wait, sorry, I have one more paragraph. Everyone else took more than their fair share. So I feel like um, you are proposing a catastrophic, unreasonable, overreaching ordinance aimed at paralyzing landlords, condemning our rental properties, annihilating our property rights, and destroying our economic futures. No, do not pass this. It needs more work. It needs to be equitable between tenants and landlords. No, no, no. Thank, Thank you. you. I agree. Tonight is probably one of those times where it's a very unenjoyable time to be up there. And I do appreciate the comments. I have tenants that I've carried and tenants that I'd like to get rid of. But when we talk about equity, my wife and I started married in Fairfax in 1979. We started in the back seat of my $25 67 Ford XL sedan. We didn't have any money. My wife and I didn't have the privilege of going to school. Instead, we saved every little penny we had. We didn't go out drinking with our friends. We didn't get to do our drugs with our friends. We'd go camping with our friends so we didn't spend any money. So we had nothing, but we saved that money to buy things. Eventually, by buying and selling things, we purchased the club. The club was a place where I came to Fairfax to have a dream, to put in a hotel, to make something to benefit this community, which was shot down. So it's kind of the place where dreams come to die. But it's also giving me an opportunity to watch the lack of due process on so many different fronts. Here, I'm very active in the council meetings because of the investment that I hold. I have a great deal of time that I spend with most of you and probably more so with the police and the fire and all the different departments of this town than anybody else, because I am very engaged. What I see is so many times like tonight that the council, you might really have a belief in something. And I commend you for that. And I appreciate that you'll stand up with that belief. But many times it, that belief and decision is moved by a mob and it becomes a popularity contest instead of looking at really what's in front of you. What's in front of you is we have, an, a, the elephant in the room is really the cost of our housing. Why is it so expensive? It's from adding additional things like this on top of it. All these things translate to raising your cost. Last week, I actually broke down on my property. I'm speaking on behalf of a group, but in breaking down my property, I looked at just my utilities, so I pay everybody's utilities and just my property tax. Over the last 20 years, because the fire, the flood, all those fees, my property taxes increased 3.5% annually over 20 years. Anybody like to see the exact figures, you are welcome to them. My utilities, annual increases divided out over the 20 years increased 15%. So you're ask, asking me with your, your ideas here, because I don't think they're well thought out when you have things like paid utilities, that it's actually going to be a negative amount. In fairness, I love my property and I've subsidized it all these years. But is it really fair when we talk about equity that you're asking one group prejudiciously to absorb the ills of our society instead of saying, hey, we all have to take a piece of this. All of you guys are going to give up some of the equity in your house. And when you sell it, nope, that's going to go to this fund to help people. And quite frankly, the people that we should help are those people that are disabled, those people that haven't had the same chance, the same fairness that we have. But if somebody can work, that's up to them how hard they want to work and how they want to spend their money. But I encourage you guys to look at a rent control that's fair and equitable to everybody. You don't go to the store and say, oh, food's going up, so we want you to cut it down 30%. So instead, instead of hearing this comment like, oh, you're going to be the first town and celebrate that, maybe to make a mistake. 
Instead, you can be the first town to really sit down and try to get the landlords to the table. Due process was blown there outside of the come to these meetings. I haven't heard from anybody on this subject in any capacity. You all know me. I've spoken to each and every one of you, okay? And there's other people that haven't been represented outside of a large mob that's come to you. So again, I encourage you to really expand your thinking and whatever you guys wanna do, that's fair, but make it fair to both sides. I believe your attorney can also support this in California. You also can't enforce attorney fee provisions in a contract that are only one-sided unless both parties are at the time the contract is drafted and both are represented. There's also things that people get around this, like a California provision 1542. Also in your ordinance, I did not see any sort of incorporation of banking or, tent or landlords like myself that have not passed on all of those increases that you can and how they're interpreted into this law. So what I'm really saying is, it's a good thing to look at these things because some people have been disadvantaged, but it's a better thing to really stop for a minute and understand the ordinance that you're passing or offer it to everybody for a fair vote. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak in the room? I'm not seeing any, so... My guess is we have some raised hands on the Zoom. Yes, Madam Mayor, I see 12 raised hands. Okay, thank you. Um, the first speaker is Jay Greenberg, followed by Michael Sexton. And Jay Greenberg, you're unmuted now. Yes, hi. Um, so this is a tough issue for sure, but why does one group have to subsidize another? I'm a landlord and I own one duplex in Fairfax and I'm all for the town trying to raise a bunch of money so it can buy housing and have low rents for people that need it. Um, but I don't think it's fair for me to subsidize uh, tenants or be forced to do something. Like most of the other landlords, I didn't know this was happening. I live in Marin. First I heard about it was from Michael. And this, I guess, anecdotally, during COVID, I had a tenant who didn't pay rent for almost a year, and I couldn't evict her. People still had to pay for gas. People still had to pay for groceries, but they didn't have to pay rent. My property taxes, like the guy who just spoke before me, go up every year. Water goes up, all the utilities go up. The state's already passed rent control. I believe this should be a statewide issue and it shouldn't be done at the town level. But if it was gonna be done, it should be done by a vote of the citizens, not a few well-meaning people. Um, as other people have said, Rent control reduces the investment in properties, uh, which reduces the demand and then the property values, which ends up hurting us all. My property is currently vacant. And after listening to this meeting, I'm not sure I want to rent it. And I think that as that continues, this is not going to be good for Fairfax. And I've probably had over the 15 years I've owned my property, I've probably had four or five Section 8 tenants that I've helped with. And, you know, I don't want to be forced to do something like this. So, please. Thank you. Please, um, Thank you. The next speaker is Michael Sexton, followed by Lakshmi Del Sesto. And Michael, you're unmuted now. You may have to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak. 
I'm a 22 year resident of Fairfax, homeowner and landlord of an owner occupied duplex on Chester Avenue. I just found out about these uh, terrible ordinances today. Uh, this is a huge decision. I'm not sure why it's not presented to the Fairfax voters uh, because it can, it's going to affect um, so many people negatively and not really help with the rental market. Uh, I understand uh, housing is, is expensive. It's uh, very expensive for me also. What I can deduce from the where to, whereas section of these uh, ordinances is at least 43% of the rental units are not in large complexes. These are single family homes, duplexes, potentially owned by mom and pop landlords or small family groups. That stat is very important in making a fair evaluation regarding the ordinances because of the direct negative effect these ordinances will have on the 567 small private landlords, uh, the town and the future residents who want to buy into this town and offer rental housing. I would like to reiterate that landlords are people also. They're your friends, they're your neighbors. I'm a mom pop landlord and I depend to a large degree on the income that the rent provides. My rental unit represents a significant portion of my net worth, about 90%, which means it's also my retirement. Having restrictions on the rental unit beyond what state law is means that restrictions are on my retirement, potentially meaning my inability to pay for future medical treatment, pay the mortgage, and pay for the upkeep of both the unit and my Fairfax home. I am not a wealthy or corporate landlord. I'm a long-term home homeowner and Fairfax resident, and implementing these ordinances will make me nervous about my capacity to offer my unit to a non-family member. I do not want this to pass as is. It's going to create lawsuits for the town and hardship for a lot of mom and pop landlords like myself. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Lakshmi Del Sesto, followed by Ian Gray. And Lakshmi, you're unmuted now. Yes, hi. Um, my heart is just aching and racing as I hear all of these arguments on both sides. Um, it's, it hurts. <laughs> um, I've been a 30 year resident of Marin County. Um, over 10 of them in Fairfax. And um, I am a music educator. I teach um, music to young children in preschools and um, public elementary schools. I have lots of jobs. I work five, six, and seven days a week. And my rent is 50 to 60% of my income. And the only reason I'm still in Marin is because the landlord that I currently have has is asking what would be considered a reasonable amount of rent, and it's still up to 60% of my income. Um, uh, if I am booted from Marin, I am leaving a whole foundation of support that I've built for 30 years. I don't want to leave. I have had insecure housing before I found this place for two years. My mom and pop landlord, landlady, uh, asked me to leave during COVID because she wanted to return my, my bedroom into a separate unit and raise the rent. And she kept telling me that she wasn't evicting me because it wasn't personal. And I said, it's still, I'm being evicted. I didn't want to leave. I begged her to not have me leave at that time. And she was a friend of mine, mom and pop house owner made me leave. And it, I don't think I'll survive another move um, with the rents the way they are. Any way that you can support people being able to have homes that don't have the same power as people who own their homes. Please, I urge you to consider passing this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ian Gray, followed by Essence Goldman. Ian, you're unmuted now. Hi, uh, this is Ian Gray. 
My wife, Lynn, and I, we have a small duplex in Fairfax, and uh, I, like many others, just found about this yesterday, and it's, it's super concerning to me. We've not raised our rents for years, and this this is going to really impact us in that the way it's being implemented, is essentially, it's going to punish us for having, you know, our partnership with our tenants where through COVID, we supported them and uh you know kept them whole they are healthcare workers and we wanted to make sure that they were okay and so we we chose not to raise their rents our taxes have gone up a lot our insurance with the fires in california have doubled our water bills are going up the bonds are going up and and we're carrying that load with these rents that we haven't increased due to our partnership with our tenants we want to support them. We want to have a fair and equitable relationship. And often we've talked about how we are trying to maintain reasonable rents and, and keeping that equity uh, with the community. I think that the way this is written is very difficult for us to accommodate. We are currently about 2% return on equity for these units and if we're not able to at some point like we have been carrying the load for a long time here without raising the rents if we're not able to at some point just get to even we're not looking to to rip anybody off we're not looking to take money out of people's pockets we're just trying to stay even and the way this is written it's just really going to be difficult for us to maintain that and for me personally I don't know that I want to stay in Fairfax uh, uh, with these rental units. It doesn't seem to make sense to me any longer. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Essence Goldman, followed by PJ Pfeffer. And Essence, you're unmuted now. You may have to unmute yourself. Can you find the mute button and press it? Essence, if you're there, try to unmute yourself. You can move on to the next hand. Okay. Give them time to figure it out. Okay. Next speaker is PJ Pfeffer, followed by Ellen Lovledge. And PJ, you're unmuted now. Thank you. Um, just want to make a few clarifying comments. Uh, first, every business has to follow every applicable law and this law is no different than any of those there's nothing that means that this law requires someone to have a lawyer review it uh, as opposed to any other housing regulation uh setting aside owner occupant landlords you know uh agnostic on that right now renting property to people is a business uh and no one is forcing anyone into any particular line of business. Uh, you know, I also want to note, uh, as this was brought up, price controls during inflation do happen. They've happened in this country. Um, you know, I wanted to note also this was, uh, Sar Lindbeck was cited as an economist against rent control. Um, I just want to note that rent control is not a one-sided uh, issue uh, amongst economists. And uh, Saar Lindbeck is, himself is a telling citation. Uh, his criticism quoted was on the Swedish rent control program in the 60s. And it was uh, a criticism made in conjunction with a criticism of literally any social welfare at all. Um, this is a, an economist who celebrated James McGill Buchanan, who everyone should be aware of, uh, and if not, should very much look him up. He's the architect of the most severe right-wing economic and political 
project ongoing in this country from its in initial reaction and opposition to school integration in Virginia in the 50s and continuing through to today. Uh, one last note, the number of vacant units uh, is an indicator of landlords willingly holding units vacant uh, years at a time often, which is not good and something these laws aim to restrict. Uh, I think I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try um, Essence Goldman. I'm unmuting you again, just in case you um, were able to figure it out. Perhaps they stepped away. Okay. Are there any more hands? Um, yes, only 10. Uh, okay, Ellen Lovelidge, you are next, followed by Pamela Miggs, and Ellen, you're unmuted now. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, we've been working on this as it's um, been mentioned since February and are really grateful for the time and hard work our confidently elected officials have put into it. Um, it's also really exciting that we'll be making history as the first town in Marin to implement this policy and other towns are already interested in replicating our work. Um, as far as staying aware of this information, the, um, some free, free newspapers have carried it um, on the cover. Um, and as far as I live, if you're making money off of a business, you're required to follow, um, you know, follow laws and it's part of your job to stay aware of those laws. Um, there are different rules. If if I remember correctly, there are different rules in this ordinance for, or in these in these for um, smaller landlords versus corporate landlords. Um, also, this uh, this like rent control as a policy has um, no negative effect on our housing supply. Um, according to studies, the positive societal outcomes outweigh any economic concerns and lead to continued family investment in the community. It's been voted on elsewhere and um, overwhelmingly supported by communities. Um, we really need to keep our community inclusive. We've seen the price of everything go up drastically and housing is one of those things that we really can't afford to raise in that same manner. Um, we've heard a lot of blanket statements tonight and as a renter, in many cases, we literally can't afford to buy a residence in this community. Um, if this equitable policy scares landlords this much, perhaps they should release the housing onto the free market and give us a better chance at affording housing. Um, it's been mentioned that that you know they're looking at this as them subsidizing as landlords subsidizing renters. Um, another landlord mentioned that his tenant has subsidized his property. This isn't about money. This is about shelter. Lots of people have also expressed a negative view of the potential implications on our town. There is no chance that this policy will do anything negative to this town. And it's sad that you would, that you would go to that point um, to begin with. Um, thank you so much again for your time on this and we urge you to vote yes on both ordinances tonight. Thank you. The next speaker is Pamela Miggs, followed by Mallory Geithein. Pam, you're unmuted. Good evening, everybody. I spent several hours on the 40 page draft. Um, parts of it are convoluted. And if you're not an attorney, you have to check in with people and ask. And I felt that um, that was sort of disrespectful to the town and that a lot of people still don't understand parts of it or maybe all of it. But the thing that I also researched over and over again, it was the benefits and the risks or the not benefits. And again, over and over and over, Fairfax will lose rental units, period. I'm not going into the details. You need to all do re more research on it is what I'm thinking at this moment. Um, I also wanna, you know, people talked about not being notified. I think leadership, including the mayor, the attorney, and the town manager should have sent out cards or to the um, landlords 
they are they were left in the dark they don't read the paper they don't come to council meetings you know they're just not those kind of people um the other thing i want to talk about is de democracy and that the word democracy democracy means power of the people you need a ballot vote on this with your good you know i'm sure there's going to be a referendum if you do not do a ballot vote and also the issue of equity i mean let's talk about equity it's the idea that everyone should have the same opportunity, and that is to vote. So I, that's kind of where I'm at with this. And I've talked to many people all over town. I've lived here, I don't know, 40 plus years. They're very upset. They're angry. And I would suggest that you tone it down or back down and really look at all these issues that have come up tonight. Thank you. The next speaker is Mallory, followed by Margaret DiMatteo. Mallory, you're unmuted now. Okay, got it. Um, all right, I wanted to just say I am on the, and I've been on the Affordable Housing Committee for a while, but I'm not speaking for the Affordable Housing Committee. I'm, I'm speaking for myself and for people in Fairfax, and that is, both people in both sides of this coin. And I, I, if there is a legal way to, um, to do this, to do things like separate um, rules for corporate, corporate owners versus people who live in Fairfax and are trying to get by who are owners and people who are renters, to be to do this fairly, equitably for both sides, I wanna I wanna just suggest that we we have a town hall meeting. Um, we've done that years ago for other things. How we can take care of both renters and owners, and have an attorney there. I have a lot of questions that would be legal, and um, I don't know if we could do separate for corporate owners versus. Um, owners who live in Fairfax and are trying to get by and renting their houses and people who are renters who need um, to be able to live here and, and even work here if they can do both. Um, if there can be separate regulations, that would be great for, for individuals versus corporate. I am not interested in people who are living in San Francisco to come here and talk about what we do here because they don't have a clue what this town is about. And if this town is about community, then we have to have everybody in the community and take care of both sides of it. So I would like to propose that we have a meeting and everybody knows about it at the Women's Club and talk about this and see if there's a creative way to do this if there's a number that works for both sides, a percentage that works for both sides. And I don't know legally, that's why I would like uh, an attorney there to, to, to take this meeting and um, answer questions that we, how can we do this that works for everybody? I am so tired of having two sides of everything when we're one town and one community and let's figure out a creative way to make this work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Essence Goldman, I'm I'm unmuting you now. Okay. It's back to Essence. Yeah, I'm just trying just to see, but I don't think. Um, she's able to. Okay, moving on to Margaret De, De, De Matteo, followed by Megan Pfeffer. Margaret, you're unmuted now. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Margaret De Matteo, and I'm the housing policy attorney uh, with the neighboring Sonoma County Legal Aid. Uh, I also spent my career as a housing attorney in San Francisco, which is a jurisdiction, as noted tonight, with strong tenant protections and rent control. 
I would like to orient my comment with the recent words of a wise woman and leader. Housing is a human right. Being a landlord is an investment decision. They are not equal. These are the words of Petaluma Mayor Teresa Barrett after passage of a just cause ordinance in Petaluma, the first in Sonoma County. This was a hard fought campaign and it lacked rent stabilization. So I commend you for your care for the most vulnerable members of your community. At our second reading in Petaluma, I heard so many of the same arguments from landlords. No notice, lack of fairness in landlords, rent control doesn't work, equity, change is hard. We hear similar arguments when any business is facing new regulation. Landlords, mom and pops, and multifamily, landlords, which include mom and pops and multifamily housing owners, are a business. This, their properties are investments. We have been operating under the antiquated belief that the market will self-correct. While housing costs far exceed inflation, housing discrimination has reached endemic levels and we have endured a multi-year housing and homelessness crisis. The power imbalance between landlords and tenants has become so extreme that this regulatory intervention has the power to actually save lives, keep communities intact, and make Fairfax a town that all people can thrive, not just the wealthy. wealthy. So I just wanna thank you for your work on this. Um, and commend all of the all of the efforts that have gone into this campaign. And I just I'm really excited for you. And I hope that you will pass this tonight. And I look forward to seeing it in the paper tomorrow. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Megan Pfeffer, followed by Wynne Richards. Megan, you're unmuted now. Hi, um, if you're a good and fair landlord, you don't have to worry about this legislation. Just like if you don't speed, you don't have to worry about speeding laws. All this is set to do is level the power imbalance slightly between landlords and tenants. If a landlord is truly operating at such a loss, they could sell their property, likely at a pretty high profit. If a tenant is taken advantage of, what can they do? Move? Where? Prices are too high, inventory is too low. My mom bought her small house in Deer Park 35 years ago and it cost, what, $100,000? Now it would be a million. That's a 10 times increase. When you have the privilege to buy a home, you essentially lock in a housing price for yourself. That's not an option for people who rent unless we have legislation like rent control. My children are young. In 35 years, will they be able to afford a house that's 10 times a million dollars? Probably not. Will renting even be an option for our children in the town they grow up in? Likely not, unless there's rent control. Landlords here in Marin are getting a profit no matter what. Property values increase rapidly here, and they always have. And they're getting that profit for free because their tenant is paying their mortgage, essentially subsidizing their investment. We do not need to worry about landlords. If they think it's too much effort to be a good landlord, perhaps they should let someone else be a landlord or let someone else own and live in that home. I question the level of care and concern for tenants to, by tonight's landlords since there were they were unaware of issues in the town they are running their business in for the last eight months. Are they pushing for a ballot measure vote so they can intimidate and scare their tenants? Don't give them the opportunity. Housing is a human right. Be bold pass rent control. Thank you. The next speaker is, oh dear, Wynn Richards. Wynn, you're unmuted now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a recently retired educator. I've taught in this area for 20 years. I've never been able to own a home long-time renter. My 30-year-old daughter has never been able to even afford an apartment here in Fairfax, even though she works in town. She has to share a bedroom with a friend. It's impossible to live here. If any of our friends say, oh, I have to look for an apartment, everybody's heart just sinks because prices are so high. Even mom and pop, so-called mom and pop landlords, charge incredibly high rates. Hate to break it to you, but they do. It's not all just corporate landlords. It's really hard to live in this area. And I hope you'll help us out somehow. 
uh, or you're going to lose people. Um, I take offense to the landlords that are saying there's a mob of people that showed up tonight to uh, to um, try and get you to vote for this. Characterizing people as a mob is offensive. And I think it's also laughable that uh, they people are saying that Fairfax is going to look like a slum if this is not passed. That's not going to happen. And you know it. The scare tactics are not going to work. We need to make this equitable. Yes, that means give people a chance to live here in a very, very rich part of Marin. That's what it is. We want to live here. We want to work here. Uh, people want to take care of your children and work in your shops and educate people. It, it's got to be fair for everyone. So I really do hope that you pass uh, this fair uh, ordinance and I don't think it needs a vote from everybody in the town. You've been working very, very hard and doing your research. Thank you for all the work you've done. That's it. The next speaker, oh, I just lowered your hand, Maureen Kroll. Uh, sorry about that. Could you raise it again? Um, in the meantime, to Things moving. Um, tuna fish and monkey mind, Salem, you are unmuted now. Okay. Um, I think I need three minutes for my multiple personalities. Um, anyway, you know, don't make, I'd suggest let's not make history by going off half baked. There are a lot of really complex issues here and a lot of inequities in the whole world. And you know, it's not going to end well that it's voted. I think a lot of people don't know about it for whatever reason, um, not following the news. And I think the council can notify the landlords. And there are a lot of mom and pop landlords. I pretty much agree with a lot of what pretty much everybody's saying on all sides. It's like, we don't have to be adversarial. It's like, it's still one community, whichever side, and people don't understand each other. Um, people that have never owned a home or had a rental or had tenants don't understand the other side of it either. And there are other sides there are, and, and, and it's all heartbreaking. I know lots of people that have, I grew up here. Most of my friends left here 40, 50 years ago um, because it was expensive then. It's always been expensive. Um, anyway, I especially take note of what Deborah London, Michael McIntosh, Mark Bell, Phil Salivary, and Mallory, Mallory said, there are a lot of unintended consequences, um, especially what Mark said about, you know, how much of our housing stock, I think Mark's number was 70%, is already considered like, you know, low rate compared to the rest of the county. county. I don't know what that number is, but that number interests me, um, especially with the cost of kind of doing business if you have a piece of property. Um, in terms of property taxes, sewer bills, streets, everything else, all those costs and those numbers keep going up. And whether it's real or not, the perceived, the perception is that landlords are gonna get screwed, excuse my language, and aren't gonna be able to afford to keep up on basic maintenance, especially if they can't do things themselves. And, you know, I'd say, look at Berkeley and look at San Francisco in terms of you know, it's not going to be a slum here, but rent control is problematic. There are a lot of renters that end up milking the system. Maybe not a lot, but it happens. And there's a lot of landlords that basically gets kind of screwed as well. Um, how do you get the equitability? How do you have the conversation with, with the whole community? Um, I support rent control. We need it. But this one is not equitable and it's imbalanced. And, and personally, I think we do need to put it to the voters, but you know, how do you educate people? And also it's all, it's all human centric. We can need our housing, but we're shoving all of our housing everywhere in every once living environment. And if you look at nature, what's left, it's like all that's left is our human ecosystems and human centric systems rather than ecosystems. Yes, we need housing, but we need to control our population too. Um, as for rent control, it's a big conversation. I really urge you not to just jump on this one. I think there's inequities and problems in the numbers 
and that needs to be worked on. And Fairfax is a small burg in a big fish pond. And yes, a lot of things start here and travel out, but really, you know, don't make history without, don't, don't do it half-baked. It's like, there's things to get worked out here. Thank you, yeah, thank Sierra. You. The next speaker is Jack Buckhorn, followed by Jess L. Jack, you're unmuted now. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Fairfax Town Council and staff. My name is Jack Buckhorn. I'm the executive director of the North Bay Labor Council. And I just want to applaud you for really bringing forth a balanced ordinance. None of the issues that I've heard from uh, landlords or um, folks that rent properties this evening uh, haven't been brought up in previous meetings over the last eight months. Uh, you and your staff have diligently looked into all these areas and done the research. Uh, nothing is half-baked. This is an ordinance whose time has come in Marin. Uh, folks are going to be celebrating uh, and very, um, very happy with the work uh, that was done. Yes, there's an education campaign that will take place, uh, but when landlords can raise their rent every uh, year, that's not holding them back. We know that they can make improvements and pass those improvements on. That's part of the ordinance uh, that people haven't uh, acknowledged. Um, the just cause eviction is only for landlords that break their promise to their uh, tenants who break the lease. Uh, it's uh, in place right now and this only strengthens it. So thank you so much for the work you're doing um, to make uh, rent uh, available to everybody in Marin County. And uh, I'm sure you're aware uh, that this is being taken up this evening in Larkspur and uh, we are going to uh, move this beyond uh, Fairfax. Uh, to a broader community of renters who need it. So thank you again. Look forward to you passing both these ordinances this evening and um, your work is greatly appreciated. Thanks again. The next speaker is Jess L followed by Rick Hamer. Jess, you're unmuted now. Hi, Town Council, this is Jess Lerner. Um, Thank you so much for your work on this issue already. And I'm gonna keep it short because it's a long night and I can't improve on some of the really incredible comments that have already come before. And I just wanna say, I fully support your efforts. I'm grateful that this is happening in Fairfax. It is so needed. And I urge you to vote yes and move forward on this second reading and uh, support rent stabilization here and make history as other people have said and change lives. Thank you. The next speaker is Rick Hamer, followed by Liz Froneberger. Rick, you're unmuted now. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I think that the time has come for this ordinance. Uh, I think that the longer we wait um, makes me just think of all those friends I had in Fairfax who are no longer here because they had to leave the place they were renting and they couldn't afford to um, get another place in Fairfax and now they're gone. Uh, we can't do anything to bring them back now. Well, maybe they'll come back, but um, you know, if, if this has happened, if there weren't loopholes in 2019 or with the state ordinance that followed shortly and the county ordinance that preceded ours, uh, some of those folks would probably still be here. Uh, we need to close up the loopholes and there are elements of this ordinance that will need to be uh, revisited in the future. Um, uh, I, and uh, that doesn't change the fact that if we sit on this for much longer, we're going to lose more people who are renters who um, we've grown to know as neighbors. Thank you. The next speaker is Liz Fronberger, and um, I will try Essence Goldman after Liz. Liz, you're unmuted now.
You may have to unmute yourself. There Hi, you sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you, I'm sorry, I'm signing in late. I, I had a class, I think I, probably all the town council members um, got an email from me earlier today. I am, I'm not a business, <laughs> um, I, uh, but I, I do own a home here in Fairfax and have for 35 years. I recently turned my downstairs into an ADU, which my hope was to rent it out to someone. And I, I actually, I, I fully support rent control. Um, what makes me very nervous about some of this are all of the, um, all of the things that are involved with the just cause evictions. And it, as a senior citizen, it makes me a little nervous to think that it would take me months to um, get a tenant out who was, you know, for example, really loud or obnoxious or invited more people to come in and live with them as subtenants. I mean, I, I kept reading this document over and over again, and maybe I didn't understand it, but I just felt like I could get painted into a corner really quickly and be in over my head with one interior hollow door between me and a tenant who had two and maybe even three other people living with them. And I'd have to pay an attorney thousands of dollars, et cetera, to get an unreasonable person out. My sons can barely afford to live here. And I, and I, I want to be able to rent this place out. But the hostile tone towards people like me who are expanding their home into an affordable rental place, it's just, it's a little scary. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I just would like a little less hostility um, towards, quote, landlords when I don't feel like a business. I'm just trying to make ends meet so that I can keep living here myself. Thank you. Um, next is Essence Goldman. This, uh, you're the last raised hand. This is your last chance to try and unmute yourself. Oh, we have one more, Maureen Kroll. Sorry. Okay. Maureen, you are next. Sorry, I lowered your hand earlier. You're unmuted now. Thank you. Um, I am a 31 year resident of Fairfax and a homeowner, and I am in favor of these ordinances. I'm one of many parents whose child has had to move out of the Bay Area due to being priced out. And I believe families should be able to stay close by. I'm concerned for my fellow seniors who are renters on fixed incomes. And I also care very much about all kinds of diversity. I want to preserve the character of Fairfax. Teachers, nonprofit workers, young people starting out, many others cannot afford to live here and they are a rich part of our community. I believe these measures are important to help address these concerns and I urge you to pass the Just Cause Protections and Rent Stabilization Ordinances. Thanks. There are no more raised hands, Madam Mayor. Wow, thank you so much. 45 public comments. We are closing the public comment. Thank you. Anyone have any comments? Are we ready? Go ahead. Council Member Ackerman. Yes, I agree. I think that was uh, that was a good thing, even though it went late. We had a lot of very thoughtful comments, and we've had a lot of very thoughtful emails as well. <clears throat> um, I have a few things to say, so beg your forgiveness for the fact that it's late, but this is a pretty important issue. So we have received a lot of comments by email. Uh, the the, uh, in earlier parts of this discussion, earlier times in this discussion, the comments that were in favor of passing these ordinances were overwhelmingly in the majority in this last couple of weeks. It's been over two to one the other way. That's just by emails. Tonight, it 
we had a whole spectrum. Um, I think it's, I'll just comment a couple of things about that because they, they, uh, they kind of stick in my crawl. Uh, one of the, was actually the first person to comment tonight said that we hadn't, we on the council hadn't read this whole thing. Um, that is bullshit. <clears throat> we have spent a lot of time on this. We take it very seriously. It is not easy. Speaking for myself, I'm, I walked into this meeting tonight and at, as I sit right now, I am still unsure where we're going with this. This is not an easy thing. <clears throat> but we take it seriously. And I also think that you all take it seriously. But I will say that, <clears throat> and I won't call anyone out, but at least one person who said very loudly tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, that they had not heard about this until this week. I had a long conversation about this very thing on the day that our town picnic was supposed to happen, but remember it rained and it got moved into the pavilion. We talked in the pavilion for quite a while about this very subject. So actually that person did know about it. But as for why a lot of people did only hear about it, and I know that there are because I know that there, there are people that I know and trust who've told me just today that they only found out about this and I take their comments very seriously. Um, it's, I think that we haven't done a good enough job at getting the whole community involved in this conversation. Um, the, what I noticed tonight in the comments was that the, uh, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, who brought a lot of this to us and have been, uh, been advocating for it, uh, have, uh, have been texting people and reminding them to come to meetings. And so there's been, on that side, there's been a lot of notification and a lot of sort of bringing people out and, and, uh, and advocating for it, which is entirely right. And that's, that's what you do in the whole political process. And then only recently, one person who spoke tonight sent out a a, uh, a letter to a lot of people who had properties. And so now they're coming out. So I just have to say that the reality of it is that not that many people pay a whole lot of attention to town politics until somebody sort of tells them, hey, there's something really important and maybe even tells them what their position is on it so that they can you know, have a framework for thinking about it. And, you know, that's understandable because we all have a lot of lives, a lot of things going on. We on the council have, we have to think about this because that's what our job is. And if we don't have time for it, we leave the council. But anyway, that's where we are now. Um, I do, I did think that a lot of the emails that I've poured over, I've read all of them at least twice. Um, to try to understand all the all the arguments that I was hearing. I take them seriously and, and I think they were important. Um, this is a very serious issue, as a lot of people have said. It degrades our town's fabric and many individuals' lives. However, the law, which is what what we have that we can do here, it's not the only thing we can do on the council. We can also you know, organize a town picnic or something, but the law is a blunt instrument uh, for addressing the, the ills of, in society. Um, as a few people have said, this is capitalism. We're trying to deal with, with just the fact that the way the market works, this is an absolutely gorgeous place to live. A lot of people wanna live here, it gets really expensive. This is, we're surrounded by open space and have constrained ourselves to living in a small area. And we have to ha have to figure out how to live in that small area, but we don't want to have too many buildings. We don't want any more buildings. So that there's a shortage of housing. So that's what the problem is. And we're trying to figure out how to solve it by um, with this blunt instrument of a law. We're doing our best. I think we might be close. 
but I still have concerns, which I've expressed before. My overall concerns remain, for one, that we might, by enacting these ordinances, force property owners, primarily mom and pop, as we, as we say, and that would be that would include myself. Oh, by the way, one of the things that was said tonight was that none of us up here have any skin in the game. That's also not true. We have members of our council who are renters. We have members of our council who have properties to rent. We have members of the property who have neither. Probably we have everybody here who has done multiple of those different things. So we do uh, we do have some skin in the game. But we, I worry that we would force property owners out of the rental market, uh, either into short-term rentals of their property or by selling their rental property and who might buy it and what they might do with it is an open card that may not be well, go well for Fairfax. Um, there might therefore be fewer rental units available in the future. So that's a worry. That's what we call an unintended consequence. And I've spoken about it every time we've talked about this. The maintenance and improvement of rental properties might be less. People have spoken about that. I don't know how that would go, but there is a possibility that that might happen. Um, that would obviously affect the safety, the comfort, and the energy usage of our housing stock and the beauty of our town possibly. I don't know if that would happen, but that's something that people have been concerned about and it might be the case. And I'm also worried that town staff would be greatly burdened by the administration of these ordinances. Um, there was an estimate once offered on this in a council discussion that there might be maybe five appeals per year uh, with uh, even fewer than that requiring a hearing by the rent board, which would be council as we've got it construed right now. I'm not sure that's realistic. When I read these emails and I hear about the different odd situations that people are in that would require some thinking, some basically I think it would require a hearing. It would require discussing this situation on an individual level. That's what I mean about the law being a blunt instrument. It's kind of hard to come up with a law that's just gonna fit everybody's situation. So there are gonna be a lot that don't fit that. And those are gonna probably require um, having a, a hearing about it. So I'd, I think five a year might be um, an underestimate. So I'm concerned about the burden on our town to administer this. The cap on rental increases of 60% of CPI is, as it currently sits, is tilted toward tenants in a way in that over the years that would effectively force all the rents relative to inflation to, to actually lower. Um, however, this can be changed in the future. And that's one of the most important things to remember um, that it, this is a living document, as they say, it could be changed. Um, reducing the rent or keeping the rent increase at 60% of CPI would be appropriate for tenants who are being gouged, but not all tenants are being gouged, not all landlords are gouging them. We've heard that plenty. So we know that we've got a situation here where we're trying with one law to and several people have said this tonight, we're trying with one law to address a range of situations ranging from possibly a corporate landlord, an out of town landlord, or just a greedy landlord from gouging people all the way to someone who never raises their rent um, and is has a great relationship with the people who rent from them. And those people have housing stability because they have that relationship. There's that whole range and people are in all different places in that range. We're trying to address them all at once. Um, numerous commentators have pointed out the construction costs, insurance costs, and at times property taxes go up higher than the CPI. Uh, and the maximum increase if I understand correctly, is not cumulative. 
So if a landlord does not raise the rent one year, then the next year, they can still only raise the rent by the amount that's decreed for that year as being the maximum. They can't utilize the fact that they didn't raise the rent the previous year. Um, maybe that's something that could be looked at because as a number of people have said in, in emails, that could lead to people raising the rent every year because that's the only time they're ever gonna get to do it. If they don't need the money this year, they they are just gonna lose it forever if they don't raise it. <clears throat> upon setting the fees, which we aren't at at this point, but upon setting fees for the registration of rentals, we might wanna consider a lower fee for owners of one or two units than that for owners of multiple units. That'd just be one way to help protect mom and pop landlords a bit. And as has been mentioned in emails and tonight, uh, some landlords have lowered the rent during COVID and it, would be, it wouldn't be fair to lock them into that lowered rent. So we're gonna have to address that somehow. That could be addressed by filing an appeal, but that would need to be an inexpensive and straightforward process and the landlords would need to know that that's so. Um, I was very heartened by, um, Lucy Hollingsworth of, of uh, Legal Aid of Marin saying tonight that they are already working on materials to educate landlords as well as renters about this. I've said at every meeting we've had that I think it's extremely important that we get educational material out to landlords ASAP because there's this worry. It's this is the, you know it's 50 pages of legal document here, and so it's very hard to get through. And it by the time you read very much of it, you have the feeling that oh my god, I, there's no way I can get through all this. And many people have said tonight that they felt like they would need to have, to hire a lawyer. You shouldn't have to because it's it's not it's really not that many things that you have to follow. It's most of them are what happens if you don't do the right thing. But basically what the straightforward path is, is not that complicated, but we need to get that word out. We need to simplify it, clarify it, and, and make it easy for people to get their questions answered. That will be done. That's part of the implementation. And, and that's why the implementation would be at some date in the future that we haven't even determined yet because it's going to take time to do all that. But um, I would need to to just ask that uh, that people understand that there will be a time at which it'll be there'll be a clear sort of one pager about what this is about. And I don't think it's as complicated as it might sound like. On the other hand, and this is the conclusion of my comments on one of the two things before us tonight, which is the rent control side, section 5.55. The last thing I would say is that on the other hand, property increases in value. And so if as a person who is who owns property and rents it, um, that includes myself, you know, it doesn't have to make me money because the property is increasing in value. And for the renter, that's not happening. So there's already a really big advantage to being a property owner. On the other hand, the liquidity, that doesn't necessarily mean you can support yourself on it. So it's this, it's a complex situation. It goes back and forth when you think about it. On the other thing that we're that's before us tonight, 5.54, which is the just cause eviction, strengthening that. And we have done a lot with just cause eviction. Uh, Fairfax has already been a leader and council member caller in particular has brought a lot of things before us that we have done with regard to just cause eviction and, and tenant protections. Um, so with regard to that, that's where we see the, in the current, what's before us now, some very strong, um, some, some pretty uh, draconian, I think, consequences for uh, that 
I believe are in there to try to address uh, a behavior of a landlord of uh, saying, okay, we can we can kick somebody out for two reasons. We can bring in a family member or we can say that we're going to do construction. So we'll say one of those things. Person out gets market. out and then, huh? Or you're getting out of the market. Or you're getting out of the market. And so, and then, and so do that, get rid of the tenant that they don't like, and then turn around and reverse that and get another tenant and raise the rent. So that behavior is is a well-documented behavior and seems kind of nasty. Although I guess if you had a tenant that was really a huge problem, it might not seem so nasty, but it's largely a pretty nasty thing in that it's trying to get around the uh, a law that's supposed to protect tenants. And that's getting around that with a sort of a back door. So this is trying to close that back door by saying, hey, if you do that, 10 years later, you still have to let the tenant back in at the same rent. And that sounds pretty draconian, but that's why it's there. I don't know what to do about that, but um, so that's in that 5.54 and the just cause part of it. So it's sort of what we're looking at tonight is the concept of rent control, which is on in 5.55, and then the just cause in 5.54. A number of people tonight curiously have said that they're really in favor of rent control, but they feel like this whole uh, this whole thing taken as a whole needs more work, that needs more, more thought and probably more discussion in the community, which fundamentally I agree with that. Um, one person has asked about their long-term plan to downsize from their larger unit in a duplex they own into the smaller unit as they age. Um, that would be a really good thing for the town. They would be downsizing. They would, they would, there would still be the same number of units on the market, but it would now be a larger unit. Um, and yet that gets pretty complicated uh, the way this law is written. So how could that be done by these people? Well, it could possibly be accomplished by filing an appeal. Um, does this ordinance allow that type of an appeal or is the appeal only for on the 5.55 side of it? Not even sure the answer to that. Yeah. So we have, you know, that's can I, can I interject, Bruce, that, that legal aid of Marin today with just 1482 is a free resource to the community, both mm -hmm. for landlords and for tenants. So that will whether whatever happens this evening, that will persist. Mm -hmm. If we pass these ordinances, they they can consult on both. So that person could go to legal aid and say Correct. the situation. Current state. Current state and, it says, and future state. So it's yes. right here in the law. I can't That's right. do this, but here's yes, my it is. I mean, they would be essentially in a way, uh, as I would read this, they would be forced in that situation to ask the tenants in the smaller unit to leave, give them a certain amount of notice, but I don't know if they could give them 10 years notice oh, and, I then, and then move into that unit Offer them the larger unit, but maybe they don't want the larger can unit. I, can I, I'm not going to do. So what do they do? Can I see if I understand what you're yeah. asking? So you're talking about the appeal mm -hmm. ability, and Janet is saying that that's only in five point five five, right? Yes, and but my so my point was that they provide legal consultation and education and interpreting these laws. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm saying yes. you don't have to figure it out on your own or get legal counsel because we well, yeah, have a, a service. If the law says you can't do it, they can't tell you you can do it. They don't have that. Oh, power. They right. only have the power to, I wasn't you, saying to that. help you with the law. But if we've got a law that says you're sort of screwed, then and that was just, I, you know, maybe they wouldn't be, I don't know, but that was one of the emails that we saw. And it's just the kind of thing that just complexities, you think about a particular sure. situation sure. and it's like, well, our law, even though we thought about it a lot, it still doesn't fit that situation. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, the inclusion of ADUs, like those, including those within the house, uh, has been a concern of commenters tonight and by our emails. 
Again, these might in theory be addressed with an appeal, but it's highly unlikely be in any case, even if it was appealable, even if it was on the right side of the fence. And I think that, well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's it's hard to picture that kind of a thing where you've got someone living in your house in the same house with you and they're just absolutely not compatible and it's becoming a horrible situation but they're living in the house with you um that could be an address by an appeal i suppose but maybe not however even if it could that's kind of unlikely because who's going to want to air their dirty laundry of all the difficulties happening in their house and are the people who aren't getting along with each other going to have the same story to tell. So it could just be a very difficult situation. We've shared our household with other people for pretty much all of our lives. We're not doing it now, but that's a first for us. We've been married for 40 years. And for that entire time, we've pretty much lived communally. And um, if we had just no ability at all to choose who we were living with, if, they, if it wasn't working out, that, that would worry me. Um, I'll skip that comment, the next comment. But overall, um, I will say that an advantage of these two or this of these ordinances, along with what we've recently done that legalized certain short-term rentals, both of those have the requirement of a registration with the town, and with the town would then develop some information could actually learn a lot more about what's going on in the town so that we'd all be speculating a bit less. Um, I think that's a good thing that will help. This is certainly a serious issue. Um, and we should be prepared to modify these statutes as needed based upon the information that we gather and based upon seeing how they work. So I'm still not sure where I'm thinking, where I am on it. Um, I'm interested in hearing the rest of council members' comments, but those are mine. Thank We're you. gonna impose the 10 o'clock rule. Yeah, so um, I've looked at the agenda and we actually have to complete all items on the agenda, 16 and 17 actually have to be done tonight. So I would make a motion that we continue on and complete all items and I, See that we have a couple staff members sitting here waiting. If we do finish this, I also uh, so I I made a motion. Do you need a motion, clerk? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, motion passes. And then I have some comments that probably will be shorter. What that means is we're continuing on. We have at ten o'clock by statute. We have to review the agenda to see um, if we continue or what we pull. So we're continuing on with the item at hand. Council Member Kohler, would you like to go next? Yes, please. Thank you. So I want to say how much I appreciate hearing from a lot of landlords. Um, this the early discussions were not considering an ordinance we've only really considered the ordinance a couple of months ago and in early september one of the things we talked about was and i think it was council member goddard wanting to make sure that we got the word out more broadly so we ended up having a meeting in mid-september in the early september meeting i had asked that we do specific outreach to landlords and maybe I wasn't forceful enough, but it wasn't supported and probably I should have insisted. But I think here we are now and we've heard from what I view as a lot of mom and pop sort of landlords or mom and mom or pop and pop. But I think um, what we're hearing and the list that I saw of even multifamily housing were a lot of names of family trusts, not necessarily property management firms. So there may be corporate landlords in Fairfax, but 
my view is probably a, a larger amount are people who saved their money and bought properties or bought a property with something over the garage, that kind of thing. And I've been worried about, you know, there there is kind of this perspective that we've heard in the earlier meetings that I think gave a view that landlords are terrible people. And I don't think anybody really meant that, but because people are facing such high rents, it's hard not to feel that way. But I've been sort of hoping that we could hear from more folks who are really dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, as council member uh, Ackerman mentioned, I brought early renter protections to Fairfax in 2018, 2019. And during COVID and the just cause eviction, which I brought specifically when Wendy Botwin was going through um, what looked like an irrational eviction. And but also asked for urgency eviction moratoriums twice during COVID. And I believe other than the county, we're the only ones that passed those. But that's not where we are tonight. So listening to everybody and reading emails, I'm feeling that rent stabilization, also known as rent control, is a smaller universe, which is limited by Costa Hawkins. And while I still have some concerns, there are some issues that we've heard about potentially gentrification. I know of a couple of cases where uh, people who were students who are now are, are a lawyer and a doctor are holding on to a rent control unit in Oakland. Um, they're making good salaries now um, because it's a good deal. Um, and the Bayer is expensive, no matter what you make. Maybe if you're a tech person, that doesn't count. But um, we've also worried about, what I've worried about is that people who are normally fixing units or looking at even broader renovations probably might not continue that practice. They might be more judicious about when they do that. And I'm also worried I don't think that everybody's going to get out of the rental market and sell their properties, but I think some will. And that's where I think um, corporate landlords will come in and grab them up. This is where I've, I've talked to somebody who's a lawyer in this area of mergers and acquisitions, and he's told me in 2019, 2020, this is the highest use for private equity firms to buy up multi family housing. That's the goal. So it's going to be a target, but I feel more comfortable with the rent control alone. And um, I do have concerns that we are, as people proudly said, the smallest jurisdiction to consider this. And we have many priorities in this town that will be redirected to working on this. Um, we'll also uh, enter into contracts with Berkeley will cost us many. Having to probably hire one other staff will cost us many. I don't believe that we can totally recover all costs through rental fees and nor do I think it's fair to um, impose on landlords really high fees. And I don't know what the fees will be, but I do feel more comfortable with the rent control alone. As we've discussed, we do have just cause eviction in Fairfax, and I would have been more comfortable with more modest strengthening of that, what we've already got. When we started talking about just cause a few months ago, I tried to provide what I thought were more reasonable kind of compromises, and most were not supported. But my big concern with just cause is the universe is very broad. Any year of construction, ADUs, JDUs, single rooms in houses, units over garages, that's different than what you will generally see with um, rent control. And I'm gonna just read part of the applicability section from that. 
that it's it shall apply to all properties in Fairfax that are hired, rented, or leased to a household within the meaning of et cetera, et cetera, it references some code, including properties that contain any of the following dwelling units which contain a separate bathroom, kitchen, and living area in a multifamily or multi-purpose dwelling, dwelling units in a single room occupancy residential structure, or units in a structure that are being used for residential uses, whether or not the residential use is legal, basically. So this includes almost anything that's getting rented out. And some of the just cause strengthening is really, uh, to me, fairly burdensome. The temporary relocation payments, if you have to do a renovation and do a move out. Um, I was sort of looking at those payments and I tried to propose smaller payments and which were not supported. So if you consider 30 days, looking at how much that adds up, it can be between, be between eight and $9,000 a month. If you have something like a black mold situation, you're probably gonna be moving somebody out for three months. So that could be 24,000 to 32,000. I realize those people have to go somewhere, but I was trying to propose something a little less onerous. The trouble and exemplary damages rather than actuals. Um, at one point, um, I had looked at more actual and that wasn't supported ultimately. And ultimately I voted for it last time, but thinking about it more, I'm concerned. I feel like it's really punitive for what I call regular landlords. Maybe these are their mom and pops, mom and moms or pops and pops. And then the re-rentals, and actually Bruce, the attorney corrected us that there was an error that she neglected. It's not 10 years, it's two, five, and five. And, but after five years, it may be really difficult to even find people after five years. So I don't know what kind of burden it places how you have to locate people after that amount of time. I propose shorter time frames. And those are just some examples. So I am supportive of the rent stabilization. I would rather that we go back and um, remove some of the really burdensome parts of just cause. Um, I'm not sure that my colleagues would support that, but that's kind of my thoughts for now. And uh, I guess. Pretty soon we'll be taking a vote. Thank you. Do you have comments, Renee? Yeah, um, so much has been said tonight and um, I have done an extraordinary amount of reading, both studies that state um, a variety of opinions and a, a variety of data um, and we've heard it all. And we've listened very hard. And I do also want to echo what um, what Council Member Ackerman said about us not having digested or read the um, ordinances themselves. I can promise you that every single ounce in every iteration has been read and studied and questioned, and have worked with our attorney in in copious um, amounts uh, to get to this point. Nothing is being taken lightly. Um, and you know, I I I I stand strong with where we have landed, where we've gotten to um, this evening. Um, it was a long journey. This happens. I've been ten years here. I've watched things where, at the second reading, people come out, and the people that come out early are the people that are generally struggling with something. The organizers are the folks whose lives tend to depend on things. It happened with 5G, it happened with cannabis. The organizers are the folks that are living the damage of something that is affecting their everyday lives. And this is shelter. Um, folks organize when they find out about it because it isn't necessarily on their radar because their lives are going relatively well. And I understand the hardships. Um, landlord is not a dirty word in my book and I have no judgment whatsoever. And I would agree that the vast majority of our landlords are very good people 
And Ma and Pa seems like a crazy thing to talk about because that might mean two units and it might mean 20. And um, the folks that own Lanai wrote to us and they're a family. So um, I have no judgment here on landlords. Um, I do have one concern um, and I had this concern very early on and I've done everything that I could to understand it. And it just came up. Um, and it is the uh, just cause provisions in JDUs um, and in the single family um, rooms in people's um, houses. Um, and I would like very much, um, and I would put this out there right now, that depending on what happens this evening with the vote to move forward with the second reading, um, or not, that it would be a minute record, that it is something that we should absolutely review. We have the ability to know how many JDUs are coming in um, because we are counting very carefully for our RENA numbers. So we, we know what's happening. If we see a steep decline in folks who are coming in to permit JDUs, then I would recommend that after a period of time, we go back and review whether this is a detriment to our very affordable um, housing stock. Um, and the same with um, folks with um, single family rooms um, who may have um, independent leases, separate leases or not. So this doesn't change the ordinance in any way, but I feel that it's very important to put this um, out there. Um, I think it's called a, a minute record um, so that we make sure, and I really want to echo again, thank you, Council Member Ackerman, for talking about how this is a living document, because we know as things have come up that we're all working our very hardest to find the most equitable solution here, um, which means that things do need to have um, the opportunity to come back around to the public. We have worked very hard to um, create as much transparency as possible here. Um, as Council Member Kohler said, I asked that there be a workshop early on and we did conduct that workshop. And the ordinance has been in front of us, at least in its model form since a long time ago. So not just the last couple of months, we did begin this as discussions and a presentation was our initial um, uh, purview to rent control um, or rent stabilization. So um, I stand by the work we've done. Um, it's very important to me that we, for the record, have an opportunity to look at our JDU numbers um, and what occurs at a point of time post implementation, um, because then we will start to know um, what's going on. So those are my comments for this evening. I thank everyone for being so honest, for sharing. Um, and we, I, this is really intense. So um, thank you all. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for um, sharing your thoughts. I thought a lot of these comments were um, and concerns too were very um, poignant, uh, well taken. Um, and I just want to also thank all of the folks who've showed up, uh, not just tonight, but consistently since March. Um, and as we kind of maneuvered through all of the complexities of this, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to July when we were talking about Just Cause for hours, like painstakingly going one by one for each of the different types of categories that might be a part of strengthening the ordinance that council member Kohler brought in 2019. Um, and, and then again, thinking about the, especially getting the emails today, thinking about the um, decision in July to have that um, presentation and that community forum in September with the slide deck that um, planning director Woltering uh, put together. That was actually, um, really just kind of straightforward and almost like better than what we have to do with these ordinances, which are, yeah, one is, you know, 15 pages, the other one's 20 pages. And then you have the staff report and you have to like figure out what, you know, what whereas is go where and all that stuff. And it gets really complicated. And even tonight hearing public comment, there were obviously questions or there might have been some confusion around the percentages and the resolutions and um, how these things work together. 
so I, I, I think back to that presentation and um, very grateful to Legal Aid of Marin for acknowledging the need to have clinics that are free, that are accessible, that are um, that and and have folks notified. And and to Councilmember Ackerman's point, the the beauty of finally getting our arms as a as a community, but this is an issue that we're finding throughout the state of California with the passage of rent control at the state level, um, because there there isn't any um, attempt at the local level. There's no ground game to do rental registries. Uh, you know, the Turner Center at UC Berkeley just put out a study and they found that uh, about 30% or a third of rental units in the Bay Area are not complying with state law. But there are no rent, there are no registries that are able to keep track of it within our communities. And so we don't really have a sense. And I don't think landlords have a good sense. And I don't think tenants have a good sense of how these state laws are actually enacted and how effective they are and how we assess uh, the effectiveness or the efficacy of those laws. So this is another opportunity to really get a sense of what's going on in our community for tenants. Um, so very grateful um, to have that opportunity before us. And I know other communities are also thinking about how they approach this now in Marin, which um, it feels timely to uh, deal with this in the middle of this housing crisis. Um, the other thing I wanted to acknowledge specifically for this evening is um, very grateful for the landlords that have come out and and the the realtors and the property association folks who have um, helped to mobilize folks or bring folks to our meeting. Um, the same is true for the Marin realtors. I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars they spent on that mailer a couple months ago to all the property owners in Marin. But I know that that was an effective thing to just get a wave of people a couple months ago um, that were landlords and that were homeowners um, to engage in this issue. And so we've seen sort of consecutive waves of stakeholders joining the discussion. Uh, it's very fruitful in my opinion to hear all these different pieces. I think one of the heartening things from the recent wave of emails is a lot of the cases that were laid out um, were actually quite consistent with what's before us tonight in terms of like how folks want to treat tenants, how folks have been treating tenants. And that's been um, really heartening. I think there, there might be some confusion um, at a very high level around like, you know, rent control versus vacancy control versus this third generation where we're trying to mitigate, um, you know, excessive rent increases on the one hand. And also, and not saying that that's like happening rampantly throughout our community, but we're trying to mitigate that while we have the opportunity using this policy as blunt as it might be. And the other thing that it's doing which might get to the question of whether or not we bank things year over year or allow the banking of this, is for a renter like myself, that 10% increase, um, you know, that a couple hundred bucks every month um, for the next year. And yesterday was what, November 1st, and the letters were on the door at my apartment complex. Um, but, uh, you know, having a couple hundred dollar increase at the max that it could be year over year isn't sustainable either uh, for tenants. And um, the other issue is that the if it stays at 10% and that rent gets bigger and bigger, that annual that annual increase gets larger and larger and more and more difficult for you know working class or low income folks to stomach. And we already know that 50% of folks are rent burdened in our community in some capacity and that there's a, a a portion of those uh, like myself that are extremely rent burden where we're paying more than 50% of our take home, even with three W-2s, even working three different things, uh, we're still um, having a hard time making ends meet. Um, and, and we're trying to mitigate that as well. We're trying to smooth out those, those inefficiencies in, in the market as it is set. There, there isn't really a free market because we've you know, created certain zoning districts and we have Prop 13 and we have how many gazillion housing laws that affect the market. Um, and the market is just a relationship with the government. Um, but the, the thing that we want to do similar to, uh, you know, 
waste hauling and other things, we're trying to figure out how do we create non-biased metrics that we use to smooth out these shocks uh, for our community members. And this, you know, 5% cap or 60% of CPI, uh, whichever is lesser of the two, um, that's just one way to smooth this out, to create something that's more predictable for literally thousands of people who live in our community that have no idea whether or not they're going to get that note on the door that my neighbors got on the door yesterday. Um, they have no way to plan for it. And they have no sense of whether or not it's going to be $50 or $100 or $200. And then when they get it, sometimes, not saying this is all the time, but sometimes um, landlords do respond saying, you know, uh, it sucks, like all our costs are going up, but you know, I could have raised it even more. Um, and it's this sort of like veiled threat, like, okay, well, now I, now I won't talk about the oven that doesn't work in my my place. So I won't talk about these issues because I don't want to be have a magnifying glass on me and my rent go up even more. I don't want to be penalized for just trying to survive in the community. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the way we construct, um, the way that we have constructed the CPI here is another way, even if it, you know, encourages some landlords to use that year over year for a period of time, if they feel that's necessary, it's a, it's a much smaller dollar figure than waiting a couple years and living with that uncertainty and then getting hit with $400 or $300. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, I live in a single, single room apartment, but for people who live in multi-room apartments, that that number could be super high if it's 10%. Um, so I think that this is going to be um, stabilizing for a huge portion of our community. And we, um, we've seen it in our volunteerism. We've seen it in the way that people engage, like there's just less and less engagement because of the very, I, one of the speakers mentioned just the, the very issue of, you know, a third of our res residents in Fairfax living in a state of precarity. And um, I don't think anybody wants that. I don't think landlords want that. I don't want landlords living in a state of precarity either. And I think that's why this like third generation rent stabilization approach where we're, there's, it's a guaranteed um, return on investment and there's just more stability year over year for everybody to be able to go to their, um, you know, go to their budget and know what they're, what they should possibly be budgeting for in the year ahead and go to their employer and say, Hey, this is the way it works here. And, um, you know, I need to, I need that cola or I need that adjustment, uh, as opposed to going some random point and being afraid to ask for a 10% increase because your rent just got bumped up that much. So, um, it's a long way of just saying, I think this is, um, a useful tool, um, and I, I think it'll do a lot of good in our community, especially for, um, you know, folks that are are working. I mean, there are a lot of um, young folks. What eighty seven percent of householders under the age of thirty five are renters. It's going to affect a lot of those folks working in all of our storefronts, um, and I, we know that that's that's been a challenge the, this last year as well. We know it's going to affect a lot of. BIPOC folks in our community, 68% of Fairfax householders who identified as Hispanic or Latino or Latinx were renters. Um, and similar for biracial folks, it's 66%. So it, I think from an equity perspective, um, one of the speakers had also mentioned this, um, it's just further uh, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing and uh, um, protecting our existing uh, housing stock. Um, and actually there's there's new research that's been coming out in the last four or five years, like peer reviewed academic journals that have indicated that uh, people of color are actually more likely to be the beneficiaries of these types of um, ordinances or these types of tools compared to their white or Caucasian counterparts. So I just, there's, there's still lots of new information. It's not always just the right-wing think tanks that are putting out information. There are peer-reviewed literatures that are coming out um, that show a little more nuance in the situation, not just the like broken window approach that um, sometimes we hear about when we're like, oh my gosh, the property values are going to go down or something like that. But um, anyhow, all that is to say, I'm, I'm feeling um, 
really grateful for everybody's input. And I think this next step, um, whatever we take here tonight, um, it's going to be critical for landlords and tenants to come together with Legal Aid of Marin, with the town to figure out how we um, make sure that we do have a Fairfax that's livable for all, like legitimately. Um, and the same is true for, for the just cause eviction stuff. I know that there are some concerns. I, I too want clarity around uh, lodger versus tenant, right? Uh, pieces to things. I love the tracking of the a JADU stuff, similar to the short term. Like that was kind of my thing for short term rentals was like, we need to track this over time um, because that's also housing stock. But um, yeah, I would, would just say those with those caveats, I think some of those just cause evictions, um, stuff around terminally ill folks, giving them more notice, giving uh, disabled for folks more notice if you're going to evict them, um, giving teachers and people with kids in school the courtesy of more notice during the school year. I think some of these things um, feel like like they're equitable and they're just and they make a lot of sense. And, and it's about communicating with landlords and tenants to make sure that, um, that that's possible. But uh, these sort of safety nets are like the the last resort. I mean, there's always the opportunity that folks can uh, adjudicate these issues amongst themselves. And yet we did hear one of the speakers who called in who's saying even her best friend or a friend of hers, and she was pleading with her friend, she still evicted her. Um, so just trying to, yeah, create, create some of those safety nets. I feel quite strongly about um, sticking it out here and, and implementing uh, just cause as it's been presented. I think the Ellis Act stuff and some of the treble damages stuff are just disincentives. Um, and I don't think there are folks that are expecting those things to play out. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are some of my um, off the cuff comments that that try to gather some of the different things that are going on in my mind right now, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful comments and input. Um, a lot of a lot of what you shared, I was going to say, so I'm not going to repeat what you said. But um, I guess a couple things, just to expand on uh, Vice Mayor, something you just said related to uncertainty and how that translates into anxiety and mental health being compromised for um, renters and you know, we've been on this journey now since March, and I think this is our seventh public forum on it, and literally scores and scores of people have come forward. Um, one member of the public who came forward, a mother, a single mother, expressed her anxiety about will she be able to stay in the community if you know, she worries about it every day. And will her kids be able to continue going into the school they love and continue to have the friends that they have? And, you know, this, alongside so many comments, really struck me and helped me really check my privilege. I think as parents, um, we have a lot of commonalities. We, we worry about our kids in so many ways, but I, I never had to worry about shelter for my kids. And all these statistics that, you know, we've been quoting these statistics, Kurt Reese quoted them, Vice Mayor, I've quoted them in the past. They're all on page one of attachment A. This isn't just data. These are people in our community. These are people and they matter. There are community members. We had a, a member of our climate action committee recently get evicted. I don't think it was a legal eviction, but she's gone. These are people that are donating their time to our community. Um, so all of these statistics matter, but they are people to me. And I think they're people to all of us. Um, and, you know, if this, if this, there's some imperfection here, I think we're all committed to listening and modifying over time. Like, that's what I'm hearing. That's how I feel. That's what I believe. 
Um, and I, I spoke with Lucy Hollingsworth earlier today, and she, um, as was mentioned earlier, we've started working on a Q and A for tenants and for landlords, and it's really good. And I can't wait to get it out. Um, but we also want to have a town hall for landlords because I do. You know, we heard you tonight um, loudly and clear, and you are part of our community. And I don't think anyone on this dais has used the word greedy for mom and pops in particular. I, I don't I don't have that perception. Um, and I appreciate that some mom and pop landlords don't consider yourself a business, but it is income. And you're in the business of offering a home to someone and st home stability is so critical. Um, so I, I guess what I wanna make sure everyone recognizes is that landlords are entitled to a rate of return. And you can, there's listed all the types of expenses. And so you are encouraged to maintain your property. You're encouraged to, you know, look at the increases in your 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 tax your property taxes your landscaping your property management all, all of that factors in and it and it should factor in um so i just i wanted to offer that to you um it's in the ordinance itself and i just want to make sure that that's that's recognized um i think that's all i wanted to say that I'm very proud of this work. I see it as anti-displacement of community. And um, I wanna thank everyone, the scores and scores of people who showed up tonight and in the past eight months. And with that, I will hear a motion if there is one. Well, I would be happy to um, make a motion to waive second reading and read by title only and adopt uh, the ordinance amending chapter 5.54 just cause evictions of title five of the Fairfax town code. I will second. May, 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 uh, oh, would you accept a friendly amendment to make sure that we capture the, the measurement clause, whether it should say um, that we establish a date of review for well that doesn't go in the ordinance though right we're capturing that no, for the but it's record in the motion. As the, and but that's it, where we capture it, it, it in, the in the motion and we are doing them separately and so you want to have a review of jadus and the number of the trend JADUs, the, the run rate and the uh within and starting a year after implementation yes. starting a year is is right. That works. Mm -hmm. um, and then the single family. That, so for clarification that we don't have about single single rooms in people's houses, um, that that also we had establish a way to to review that or to can Janet just I, speak to that right now? I don't know that we have that information. I don't know how we would so get that could information. You, I know we're mid in the motion, FAQs. We can do that if we could do that in. Sure. Oh, you mean in put it in the in the, the FAQs. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought you meant right. collect it to study it. Also, don't forget the two corrections on the five. There's right. one. Oh, the ten to five. Out. Yeah, right. it's spelled out five and the number five. Okay, yes. so um, would you mind, Vice Mayor, just read that first part into the motion? That the, yes. So I'll just re restate restate that. the with that um piece yeah so maybe just to clarify before you add that make sure that you do your motion have the air the corrections that the town yep. attorney did and then add these sure just so we're clear good and then we'll take the second one after that one okay Waive second reading and read by title only and adopt this ordinance amending chapter 5.54 just cause evictions of title five of the Fairfax town code with the two amendments in the Ellis Act provisions changing the years from from 10 to five. Um, and uh, with a review in in one year of the um, JADU. Yeah, one year post implementation date. 
yeah, post implementation date. Okay. And then, um, and, and with uh, ensuring that we're, we will have clear information about the like lodger versus tenant um, rights um, and, and definitions in our outreach to the community. Sounds good. I'll, I'll I, second. I, I, I was going to second the motion That's if you what don't I mind. Thought, yeah. I wasn't <laughs> sure you. if you were doing it. All in favor? Or no, Michelle, can we get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Council Member Kohler? No. Council Member Ackerman? I guess I'll vote for it with the provision that we're going to look at it. I, I hope we're going to look at a lot more than just the JAD year, but we need to just look at how this works and know that we can change it. I'll vote yes. Council member um, Goddard. <laughs> I vote aye. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. So that is four yeses, one no from Council Member Kohler. Motion passes. And now there's a second motion. So this is to waive re, uh, second reading and read by title only and adopt the ordinance amending chapter 5.55 mandatory mediation for rental increases of Title V of the Fairfax Town Code. I second the motion. Do, do Can we have a roll call vote, please? <laughs> Council Member Goddard? Yes. Council Member Kohler? Yes. Council Member Ackerman? Yes. Vice Mayor Cotrano? Yes. And Mayor Hellman? Yes. That is five ayes. We're going to take a break. Yeah. We're going to take a five minute break. Thank you. And we're back. And we are moving on to item number 16. And um, I'm going to. What? Motion to waive the 1130 rule. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to waive the 1130 rule. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can second it. I'll second it. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Aye. I said aye. I should have said aye. Okay, no nays. Motion passes. Um, item 16 is to introduce ordinance to adopt the 2022 California Building Standards Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Parts one, two, two point five, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, excuse me, not seven, eight, ten, eleven, and twelve, which consists of the California Administrative Building, Residential, Electrical, Mechanical, Plumbing, Energy, Historical Building, Existing Building, Green Building Standards, and Reference Standard Codes, with local amendments and adopting the 2021 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code. CEQA, exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to section 15061B3 or in the alternative sections 15307 and 15308 of the state CEQA guidelines. Mr. Lockerbie, you're still with us. Thank you for hanging in there. And Sean, you're, uh, you're also here. And I don't know if David's going to be, David's not presenting tonight. Okay. So you two want to take it away? We'll take it away. Good All evening, right. Mayor and Council. Um, we're kind of, we were really excited when we saw everyone in the crowd that was here for the code adoption. And, and uh, now it looks like maybe they weren't here for us. But, <laughs> um, anyway, on uh, July 1st, 2022, the state of California published and made available the 2022 edition of the California Code of Regulations, Title 24, consisting of the following codes, the California Administrative Code, 
building, residential, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, energy, historic building, fire, existing building, reference standards, and the green building standards code. The state has mandated that local jurisdictions must adopt the codes with the appendices and amendments to be effective by January 1st, 2023. California building standards are applicable to all occupancies th throughout California, whether or not the local government takes an affirmative action to adopt those California building standards. However, the standards enforced by statute will be without added appendices or amendments. In addition to the mandatory updates required by the 2022 California Building Standards Code, this ordinance proposes to continue the town's progress towards electrifying the building and transportation sectors by adopting local amendments to the building code that require increased electric vehicle infrastructure to be built during new construction and additions or alterations of existing buildings. Furthermore, this ordinance also includes stronger energy efficiency and electrification requirements for additions, alterations, and remodels and will assist the town in achieving its GHC reduction, energy savings, and environmental protection goals. I will let Sean discuss this in a little more detail. Thank you, Mark. Um, the proposed ordinance incorporates the county's green building uh, model reach code uh, that we previously discussed at the October 11th uh, council meeting and the meeting before that. Um, <clears throat> And it includes staff and council recommended uh, revisions that were discussed during the October 11th council meeting um, that are listed in the staff report. The ordinance includes three notable changes related to the town's current um, green building requirements and builds off them. Number one, uh, for existing single family residences undergoing additions or alterations, uh, will be required to implement additional energy efficiency and electrification measures beyond the state code. Additional energy savings are achieved through a performance compliance pathway uh, recently developed by the state. The flexible compliance path is a points-based system uh, allowing homeowners and contractors to select from a comprehensive menu of energy efficiency and electrification measures that are appropriate for the scope of their uh, project. This requirement applies to single family additions and alterations affecting 200 or more uh, square feet. The ordinance includes specific language exempting ADUs and JADUs created as part of an addition or alteration. The additional energy efficiency standards proposed for the single family uh, additions and alterations have been demonstrated to be co cost effective in modeling studies completed by the statewide REACH codes program. The second notable change is a requirement that all covered projects as specified in the ordinance meet Cal Green Tier 1 standards. This ordinance requires all projects including new construction and additions and alterations affecting 200 or more square feet meet Cal Green Tier 1 standards uh, with verification provided by the installer or designer, um, excluding Tier 1 energy efficiency provision, as well as for uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure for certain building types, which is the third notable change to um, the green building requirements um, for EV infrastructure uh, that exceed Cal Green standards. The proposed ordinance requires that single and two family residential and non residential uh, new construction meet Cal Green Tier 1 standards to be EV ready. So, essentially, to have a, a charging receptacle in the home. Um, only state minimum standards will be required for non-residential grocery retail or warehouses planned for off-street uh, medium to heavy duty uh, vehicles. Um, for multifamily residential new construction, EV standards will go be above and beyond state standards by requiring the ability for 100% of units with parking spaces to have charging capabilities. Well, of the total parking uh, spaces, 15% will be required to have level two charging stations and 85% will require low power level two EV ready receptacles. For additions and alterations, EV standards for single family projects meet Cal Green tier one standards um, to be EV ready. 
state minimum and Cal Green standards exist for multifamily residential and non-residential projects uh, being remodeled. However, the state standards miss the opportunity to maximize the moment when parking lot services and or service panels are upgraded by requiring the installation of EV infrastructure at time of uh, parking lot upgrades, developers can fully benefit from construction savings and install valuable amenities for their occupants. In response, um, additions and alterations for multifamily residential and all non-residential projects in Fairfax would go above and beyond state standards while improving upon previously adopted standards by requiring the following. Um, if the service panel is modified, uh, add designated electrical capacity so that 20% of on-site parking spaces can be level two EV ready. If the parking lot surface is modified um, in any way, uh, add the conduit to a minimum of 25% of exposed parking spaces and install a minimum 5% EV charging stations to parking spaces uh, requiring any combination of level two and direct current fast charging or level three charging. Um, <clears throat> the proposed ordinance also includes the updated definitions from the model reach codes published on October 7th um, of this year. It does not include separate EV infrastructure requirements for hotels or motels, um, as in the model code, uh, to maintain simplicity and avoid having too many different requirements based on the building type. Um, and one correction I just wanted to make from the staff report is that any new hotels or motels or additions or alterations of hotels and motels would be subject um, to the default Cal Green Tier 1 requirements, so not, um, not, not for uh, non-residential. Um, essentially, the requirements would be the same as um, for the multifamily. Um, and just to be specific about that, if there were any new um, hotels or motels, uh, new construction for those, 10% of the total parking spaces would have to be EV capable. 35% uh, of the total number of parking spaces would have to have low power level two EV charging uh, receptacles or be EV ready. Um, and for hotels with more than 20 guest rooms, 10% of the total parking spaces would have to be have level two uh, EV charging stations. And if there's any remodels of those hotels or motels, 10% um, of um, any newly added or altered parking spaces would have to be uh, EV capable. So th those are all in the, the Cal Green uh, code, um, the 2022 uh, code, um, but just wanted to make sure I clarified that. Um, and I, yeah, I believe that is it for my part. So I will pass it back to Mark. Additionally, we are recommending adoption of the 2021 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code that is not included in the California Code of Regulations, but is included in the ordinance because it is referenced for use in the California Building Code. The fire code will be adopted separately under Chapter 8 of the Fairfax Municipal Code. Staff recommends continuing the practice of not adopting Appendix B, Board of Appeals of Title 24. Without the adoption of Appendix B, the town will be following Section 2.44010 of the town code, which provides for an appeal to the town council. The following amendments are we are carrying forward to make the building code consistent with the fire code, definitions and alternate power supplies. The following chapter has been amended to have the WUI code apply to additions, repairs, and exterior alterations. Exterior fire resistive construction, automatic sprinkler systems, fire extinguishers, and smoke alarms. The amendments we will be carrying forward due to local climatic, geological, and topographical conditions are 15.04.030 roof coverings, 15.04.035 barriers for swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs, 15.04.40 septic systems, 15.04.060 acclability of the 2006 Wildland Inter Urban Interface Code, 
The following items will continue to be included in chapter 15, but are not amendments to the codes. Plan check fees, correcting past violations and fee adjustments. Staff is recommending council introduce and do a first reading of an ordinance amending the 2022 California Building Standards Codes, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Parts 1, 2, 2.5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 11, and 12, which consists of the California Administrative Building, Residential, Electrical, Mechanical, Plumbing, Energy, Historical Building, Existing Building, Green Building Standards, and Referenced Standards Codes with local amendments and adopting the 2021 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code. This concludes the staff report and we are available for questions. Any questions from, sorry, I asked to put the heat on, sorry. I'm okay, that's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions? Thank you for that. Um, I, th I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just gonna ask it to make sure. There's no point in the code at which anybody is required to put in a level three charger, right? Because that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's makes sense. They, they have an option. Um, so you can use it in, in places, but as an option, but. Yeah, it's, it's usually, required. so just, to provide that example again, um, if the the parking lot surface is, is modified mm -hmm. and that's um, under it, yeah, if it, if it's additions and alterations of um, uh, the multifamily or non-residential type projects, they they have the option of installing that you have to install a minimum five percent EV charging stations, but that can be any combination of level yep. two right. or essentially level three. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, yep. I just was checking that to make absolutely sure <laughs> no other questions any other questions before we open public comment okay open public comment on this item please first off i'd like to again say thank you very much for all four, five of you guys, but especially the mayor for allowing us all to speak a little bit longer on the just cause and um, rent control. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to bring up tonight are three subjects on this. One, I think last month when Mark brought forth and explained that if you really put this down to 200 square feet, and to the best of my knowledge, remodel is not really defined. What's that mean? Painting, replacing your carpeting. But at 200 square feet, the cost of implementing all these things will just make it where people can't do it. People won't get permits. And what we really want, we want to encourage people to get permits so we actually see and encourage them to do the construction in the right way that's safe for everybody. So I don't think this is really that safe. <clears throat> Second point, on Saturday, um, I worked... I work with the CAP program and we brought four kids down to CHP and they were looking at job opportunities for the future. And we, we actually discussed with the CHP about implementing electric vehicles. Well, if you take out a car and they said that they average around here 200 miles, but so if you take out a car that's electric and you run your 200 miles, but then you're also get, keeping your lights on and all your computer, it's probably one shift. Then it takes four hours to charge that, which means they're going to have to duplicate the amount or number of cars to implement a program that has all electric vehicles. So again, we're looking at increasing all these expenses that we might not be able to, as well as we're putting additional requirements and drain onto our grid. But last but not least, if you really think about this, how arrogant are we? This is the most arrogant thing I can think of the town's done. We're not cleaning our air. We're exporting it to somebody else. And the reason I'm saying we're exporting it, somewhere somebody is creating this electricity. Somewhere there's some sort of consumption of energy to make this so that down here we can drive our little cars and stuff without seeing the exhaust because we don't want to see it. But what we've done is we've exported collectively all those products to make this energy to somewhere else. So we're saying, 
we're so good and we talk about equity, but we're gonna make this poor community have all the exhaust. So it's something to think about, thank you. Good evening, council, again. Um, I agree with Michael about the permits. What we need to do is encourage people to get permits, not discourage them through excessive costs. Uh, I've already lost one home because someone didn't pull a permit for a hot tub with 30 amps of electricity and start a 70,000 acre fire with it. And that was because no permit because they were just trying to do it to avoid the expense. Uh, secondly, um, we all remember the compact fluorescent light bulb, I think, which is pretty much obsolete. And we're putting in all this infrastructure for electric cars. Uh, I'm on a waiting list right now for an Aptera car, which is entirely solar, won't have to be plugged in if I drive it less than 40 miles a day. So maybe we're kind of jumping the gun on putting in all this infrastructure, which in 10 years from now, instead of the CFL like we had, they'll turn into LEDs. So in other words, we are on the cusp of more efficient electric vehicles, but yet we're investing in level two chargers, which will, as Michael said, be just transfer, transporting our carbon footprint somewhere else. Thank you. Are there any hands raised on the Zoom? I'm seeing no more members of the public here. Um, yes, there is one hand raised, and that is Frank Egger. You are unmuted now. You might have to unmute yourself. There. Thank you, Michelle. Frank Egger, Men Away. Um, listening to the ordinance, I heard uh, septic tanks are included in the ordinance, some amendment. Um, again, this is Frank Ager, I met away. In, in 1974, because of septic tank leach lines leaching into Fairfax and San Anselmo Creeks, uh, the Fairfax Town Council passed a ban on, on the use of septic tanks for new construction because of the adverse impact on coho and steelhead in our creeks. Um, that ordinance has never been revoked. Last year, Fairfax approved the first new home in the Cascades on a septic tank since 1974. Um, so I'm, I'm just bringing to your attention that Fairfax still has a ban in effect on the use of septic tanks for new construction. Thank you very much. I see no other hands. Closing the public comment now, thank you. All right, any comments or can we entertain a motion? I would love to make a motion. All right. I, could I uh, bring up a question first? Okay. Sorry, I, this wasn't a question that needed to be asked before public comment, but so the, the uh, I think we all have before us a little, uh, just an informational item because when we talked about this on the October 11th meeting, um, I brought up the whether we included these passive solar hot water heaters um, in in this, and it. Uh, so this is this informational thing is just to acquaint us all with what that is, and so I just wondered whether that would be it, this is a greenhouse gas free way to produce hot water. And I wondered whether it would be allowable as an alternative of uh, the way this is written or, or not. These are widely used in a lot of other countries. They aren't so widely used here, but that's not because they don't work. They work pretty well. They would require electric backup during the winter too, when you had a period of cloudy weather, but um, overall they're gonna be no electricity at all. And I just wondered whether they were something that's allowable under the code the way it's written now. 
And we don't have to correct that right now. I wouldn't hold this up because of it, but that's what I'm what I'm do they have about. do they have a copy of this what you give to us? Um I think you did, right? Did it, oh okay, well here. So I, mine's all written all over. I can, yeah. I can definitely provide my, that. Mine has notes on it, I'll say give you mine. Yeah. I received the email. Yeah. yeah. Just for the record, the public has a copy out with the public packet. Yeah, it's a package supplement. So I, I'm I'm confused. Are, are you asking a question about this? Were you just calling well, it to our yeah. attention? I mean, it oh, would okay. be nice if it were in there, but I'm wondering whether it is, and I'm wondering whether staff would recommend it. So that's, you know, rather than just, I'm not demanding it i'm asking mm -hmm. the question but the question is for a purpose yeah great <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything in the code that would disallow from someone installing that um on their home uh -huh. i i will say i don't think it's included in the energy and electrification uh, electrification measures in that table two for single family renovations you know so i don't think you would get points for it for example Mm -hmm. um, although that maybe could be up to the discretion of the building official. Um, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't think there'd be anything in the code that would disallow someone from installing it. But at the same time, I don't think we include incentives for um, yep. installing it. Yeah, that seems like it makes sense at this point. But um, as you go forward with this, with the committee, possibly three years from now, you might want to consider it. But anyway, um, that's that's it. Just kind of bringing it up. So I can go ahead and make the motion now. Thank you, Councilmember Ackerman. Waive full reading, read by title only, and introduce ordinance number to be named to adopt the 2022 California Building Standards Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Parts 1, 2, 2.5345681011 and 12 which consists of the California administrative building residential electrical mechanical plumbing energy historical building existing building green building standards and reference standards codes with local amendments in adopting the 2021 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code. And to set the public hearing, excuse, sorry, I'm a little tired. And to set the public hearing for December 7th, 2022. I would second that. Okay. Michelle, can we have a roll call vote, please? Or can oh. I just do it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Uh, my understanding was the council is all in the room, so we don't know. Yeah. Okay. For the ordinance, because it's an ordinance. Okay. Okay. They're all here. The gang's all here. I'll do a roll call vote. Council member Goddard. Yes. Council member Kohler. Yes. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Catrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. All eyes. And I wanted to recognize you both. This is clearly a lot of work. And thank you for staying late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think they want to do it every time. <laughs> okay, moving on. Thank you for your work on this. Last but not least, I think number 17, and this is an ordinance to adopt the 2022 California Fire Code, which was mentioned earlier, portions of the 2021 International Fire Code with certain local amendments in addition, and Appendix A of the 2021 International Wildland Urban Interface Code. And we have Senior Fire Inspector Robert Bastianin. That, sorry if I was, I'm tired as well. But I appreciate you staying late this evening with us. And I see someone else here, but I can't read your name. Derek, Derek Shaw is also in attendance. Thank you so much for staying up with us. 
No worries. Well, I appreciate you guys listening to this ordinance proposal tonight. So let's, uh, if I just jump right into it, but so again, thank you, Mayor and Council members for the consideration of an ordinance which would amend the Fairfax Municipal Code to adopt the 2022 edition of the California Fire Code and 2021 International Fire Code with certain local amendments and additions. And Appendix A of the 2021 International Wildland Urban Interface Code. This adoption process is required by the Town Council to stay current with the minimum requirements of the State of California Building and Fire Standards as determined by the California Building Standards Commission. Every three years, the building or er, yeah, the California Building Standards Commission publishes model codes such as the California Fire Code, Building Code, Mechanical Code, Plumbing Code, etc. Once published, local agencies have 180 days to make additions or amendments based on local conditions. If no changes are made during this 180 day window, the model code becomes effective. Based on the 180 day cycle, we have until January 1st, 2023 to make local changes. For the last eight adoption code cycles, the Marin County Fire Prevention Officers have met and cooperatively reviewed the model code. This proposed ordinance represents a cooperative effort to develop standard ordinance language. While some minor changes occur between jurisdictions, the end result is more consistent and cooperative approach to fire safety issues, making it easier for contractors and developers to work within each jurisdiction. The local amendments included in the ordinance do not represent any significant changes from the current code. Uh, summary of tech ordinance, other than the new ref code references, there are no significant changes to the proposed ordinance language as compared to the last ordinance number 842 adopted in 2019. The fire code is arranged and organized to follow sequential steps that generally occur during plan review or inspection. The 2021 International Fire Code, which California adopts with amendments as the 2022 California Fire Code has again been organized into seven parts. Each part represents a broad subject matter and includes the chapters that logically fit under sub subject matter of each part. The 2021 IFC was organized to allow for future chapters to be conveniently and logically expanded without requiring a major renumbering Therefore, this, adopt, this code adoption has in the past adoptions results in some renumbering. Our proposed changes inc include adoption of the 2022 edition of the California Fire Code, 2021 International Fire Code, with certain local amendments and additions. Uh, adoption Appendix A from the 2021 International Wildland Urban Interface Code. We added definitions of all weather surface exterior wildfire protection system and home backup generator and target hazards. Added a section requiring a construction permit to implement an exterior wildfire protection system and home backup generators. Added section requiring certain target hazard buildings to be subject to certain or the creation of pre-plans conforming to fire department standards. Added section requiring fire access gate setbacks to reduce hazardous traffic conditions. Added a section pertaining to exterior wildfire protection systems. Amended chapter 12 energy systems to provide clarity and additional equipment requirements for ease of use during an emergency event. And added a section for home backup generators to provide ease during emergency events also amended chapter 49 referencing local wildland urban interface areas, fire hazard reduction and relocating language addressing hazard abatement in those designated areas. And we amended sections to require additional information on a fire protection plan. I'd also like to point out that on page 23 and 25 of the ordinance, there is a, a reference to town of Ross, but that should be town of Fairfax. And on page 30, apiaries is misspelled. The A and the I are flopped. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. I just want to point out another section on page 30. You have apiaries section, which is spelled incorrectly. 
Correct. Thank you. The, no uh, questions here. Any, any. Go ahead, the, Council Member. The uh, addition, and I, I have to confess, I have, I could have researched this myself, but I haven't had time to. You said you added a section on home backup generators. Um, that so <clears throat> prior to this and the, the last fire code there, uh, there was just nothing regulating how someone installed a home backup generator, and now there is. Is that what that? What, that what we're adding language for signs, signage, and emergency shutoffs for when there's an event that, that we can actually. Show. So we'd be in accordance with the building department. We just added some additional language for that. Okay. And does this refer to a backup generator like the kind that someone would get at the hardware store where they would just plug an extension cord into the generator and run some items on that? Or is this only referring to a generator that's actually wired into the house wiring? It would be a fixed generator system, not, not the portable like you described. Yeah, okay. That's it. Thank you. Can, can I ask one question to piggyback on that? Because I noticed the definition of the home backup generator. And I know that this is like an issue. These backup generators are it's like a thing that was discussed in San Anselmo and elsewhere in the Ross Valley. So I know people do care about, um, you know, what, what they can and cannot do with home backup generators. But I noticed in the definition um, that it was specifically uh, regarding internal combustion engine or internal combustion driven backup generators. Um, so I was just clarifying. So this is focused like on diesel backup generators or something, but not on like power walls or um, like battery driven backup for buildings. Is that yeah, right? That is addressed in the code. And that's part of our energy systems. The one that we talked about in chapter 12, where we amended, it included the same shutoffs for those, those systems as well. Perfect, thank you. Okay, can we entertain a motion? Or public comment, thank you. Sorry, it's past midnight. If you could also uh, further explain as Bruce brought up and Chance, um, I don't have a good understanding of how this will change if we, for instance, have a power outage and we need to implement a backup generator. I understand from what you said earlier that there will be signs and shutoffs. What other restrictions are there? We did not place any other restrictions other than signs and shutoff requirements, identifying how to shut them off and where to shut off during the event of an actual fire. Fair enough, thank you. Hello, Rick Hamer, uh, Fairfax. Uh, I think I sent this to you all, okay? And uh, this is a, a map. You can see how many structures are on this map. Uh, we have a lot of uh, population that's on one way out uh, streets. Uh, it's already very fully populated. And with uh, the ADU laws and uh, SB9, uh, there is no upper limit to how many new housing units can be added. It goes way above the arena numbers, no upper limit, which means all these lots can be divided into two lots. All of them can have up to four housing units on those existing lots. And, um, the Appendix D of the uh, uh, fire code, which has not been adopted in this town. Uh, anytime I've pulled a permit in Western states, um, when, when I built anything, the first situation is, is the fire department make sure they can get their equipment in and out of there safely. And also that the people in there can get out without obstructing the fire equipment, thus two ways. One way for someone to get out, one way for the fire equipment to get in. And I think that we really need to entertain this because 
uh, SB9 is already law, at, at, and we will see more and more housing units being placed on these one-way outs unless we do something soon. And there's plenty of spaces to build ADUs that are not one way out, but they should not be added to one way out neighborhoods. Thank you. Are there any hands raised on the Zoom? We have no more public. Um. It, it does room. not look like there are any more hand, any hands raised on Zoom. Okay, I'm going to close public comment on this item. Bring it back to council. Any other comments? Let me entertain a motion. I'm happy to make a motion to waive first reading and read by title only and introduce an ordinance amending chapter 8.04 of the Fairfax Municipal Code adopting the 2022 edition of the California Fire Code and 2021 International Fire Code with certain local amendments and additions and Appendix A of the 2021 International Wildland Urban Interface Code prescribing regulations governing conditions hazardous to life and property from fire or explosion, providing for the issuance of permits for hazardous uses or operations and establishing a fire prevention bureau and providing officers therefore in defining their powers and duties. I'll second. Um, okay, a friendly amendment with the changes as noted uh, by senior fire inspector, Rob Bastianon and also you set a public hearing and adoption of the ordinance for December 7, 2022. Do I, that's all part of one motion, that second one? Okay, um, so then I'll accept that friendly amendment with the um, corrections and, and also add to that motion to set a public hearing and adoption for the ordinance for December 7th, 2022. Second. Michelle, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member Kohler. Yes. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Catrano. Yes. Mayor Hellman. Yes. Eyes all, motion passes. Thank you again for staying late with us and for your work on this, keeping us in compliance. Hope you weren't sitting there the entire time. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> uh, we should try to work something out about that. that like, okay. Send a text or something that we're getting close. Moving on to, uh, well, the item 18 is continued to December 7th. Um, do we have a town manager's report? Anything? I know. Given the lateness of the hour, Madam yeah. Mayor, I think we'll skip that. That is fine with me. And then in my stack, I don't have the future agenda items, but it is part of the packet. Does anyone have any questions or a future agenda items they want to raise? Not here. Okay. No one? Okay. Pardon me? Yeah. And then in may, I, may I close, may I adjourn for Tom? Oh, sure. Sure. That's what I'm doing. So yeah, Please. we're adjourning the meeting tonight in uh, memory of Tom Shearer and Tom um, and my kids. We grew up together with mm -hmm. Tom and um, his brother Bing and uh, mother Carolyn. Their father passed away when they were very young. Um, and so um, he is dearly missed and was a very um, formative part of, um, and he and his struggles through his life were really um, formative in the way everyone thought about inclusion and, and really about loving community and all of our um, differences. And so sending love to Carolyn and to Bing. Um, yeah. And uh, Tom, you're missed. Thank you.
And with that, meeting is adjourned. I wish you all a pleasant evening or morning as the case may be.